With a lot of strings on, Ross, it should pick them up. Yeah, why don't you talk those things and amp it back out to the speakers now? I think I can talk loud enough that I won't need a microphone. Um, I'm Rhonda Chapin. I'm the executive director of Second Harvest Food Bank of Northeast Tennessee. And um, we are coming to you tonight for um, a request of $10,000. And this will... Uh, 100% to help with our uh, uh, children's program. Uh, it is it is a program that's near and dear to everyone's heart here in Northeast Tennessee and in Carter County. Um, we received support last year in this amount of money, and we're asking for that again. Our monthly average in the Carter County school system to help children through the backpack program and also uh, through uh, our other children's programs, food box and backpack is 404 children. And this will not cover all of that support, but it will definitely help out. And we greatly appreciate the support. The total budget is $45,652 to support children in Carter County. And, um, we um, are asking for that support. We're also asking um, other organizations like United, United Way of East Tennessee, Highlands, and various other individuals to make up the uh, remainder of that uh, support. Overall, I wanted to just uh, give you a little bit of information about Second Harvest Food Bank. Um, we serve the eight county area and we provide food to not only um, community pantries and soup kitchens here in Carter County, but also we provide food through the backpack program and summer feeding program. And in the newsletter that we provided, we did send in, I think, enough proposals for everybody. But um, if you look on your page, the summer uh, feeding program, you can see that we also provide food in Carter County um, through uh, TLC and, and Angie Odom's um, collaborative partnership and you can see that in the summer spotlight um, in the newsletter so i'm gonna i'm gonna stop there and keep it very short and sweet but i'm glad to answer any questions that you might have thank you thank you i think i'll speak for everybody whenever i say thank you Thank you so much, and we greatly appreciate your consideration. And if you do have any other questions, we're glad to answer them um, if, if they come up tonight later on. Thank you. Okay. Let's go ahead and uh, knock out. Um, Together. So let's go ahead and, uh, Mr. Estes, let's get the Carter County Public Library, Parks and Rex, uh, and the uh, Fire Department. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm here on behalf of the Elizabeth and Carter County Public Library. As you know, I'm not the library director. Uh, director Bernie Weiss is out on maternity, so she's she and her family are happily plus one. Uh, so I'm filling in for her tonight. I'll hand out the presentation that she had prepared, and I'll keep talking as we go. What we have for you tonight is, and I'll be brief, uh, a quick rundown on Roger, I know you want them. I know you really do. Thank you. 
I'll be brief. I know you've got a long night ahead of you. Uh, what you have in the presentation is, again, a quick review of the, the library, uh, what they're all about. And obviously, you know, it's it's more than just books. It is books, but they have lots of lots of programming across the board, lots of other things besides books. If it's uh, online items, you can check out, uh, but also uh, DVDs, audio books, lots of, lots of media, lots of different formats. You're not going to want to sit here and read to you. I know you're going to be here all night, so I'm going to make it exceedingly brief. Uh, you can see here's some of the programming on page three going on the library. Uh, page four shows you a quick breakdown of where you see your card holders. 53.6% of the current card holders are Porter County residents outside the city. The remaining are within the city. Uh, you see there on uh, page four. Currently, Carter County provides $75,000 toward the operation of the library. Mm -hmm. You can confirm the number before I pull it to you. The proposed budget that we have, the requested budget that's coming up, is $588,416, $588,000, which includes the seventy five dollars that the county currently provides. There's an additional request I'll get to in a moment, but it is not in the budget currently. So of the 588, $75,000 of that is from the Carter County government. You know, the 75,000, 65, as we see on page five, $65,000 of that's going for programming at the library. And the additional 10 is for books and materials. Again, uh, what's new and different uh, and what's in our request is an additional 13,789. That's on page seven. The request really gets down to for the size library that we have, for the service area that we have, that's how they grade libraries, uh, we need to be open a certain number of hours a week, which is 60 uh, hours, and, and we don't meet that. Uh, the request is for the payroll and benefits, but it's not any benefits, but the FICA and all that, the payroll that goes with adding hours to part-time people we have, not, not adding more staff, but just giving them more hours. So four people would get on average five hours extra a week which would give us enough uh, to meet the 60 hour uh, requirement according to state library and archives standards. So that's the request on the library. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Again, I'm a talker, so I'm done being brief on, on purpose, Mr. Chair. You're fine. I'm going to ask you, you've got percentages. You know how many actual card holders you do have? Uh, it should, uh, let me see if I can recall. Uh, yes, we have, as of the end of the calendar year, 27,002. You want to break down from there, I can give you the numbers. No, I, I just want to know, just do not risk it. Anything else on the library? I, I can move on. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Deputy Chief Hart with me here if you have any particular specific questions as to the fire department. Uh, Chief Carrier is under the weather tonight. So Deputy Chief gets the pitch hit for us. Uh, but briefly, uh, the, the request that we have for the Elizabeth and the fire department is uh, we would request to get the same level of funding uh, that you provide the other volunteer fire departments. Uh, I'll give you a, a basic justification on that. Uh, plain and simple, I won't feed it to uh, we're appreciative of what you give us now, which is $5,000 a year. We, we very much appreciate that. But our request would be to be treated the same as the other fire departments for this reason. Uh, the county provides money for fire service for every Carter County resident at an equal basis, except for those county residents that happen to exist within the city. And obviously, you know, the city has a tax rate and we support the additional service that we have to have the fire department. We have, but that's on top of Again, the base level. So, as a matter of fairness, you know, to your constituents, we request that you look at that and have that same base level. We're not going to back off what we do, but that, that's a matter of how that funding is allocated. And you know, as you all know, we, we cover a number of county buildings, both uh, county government and school system, uh, and about a quarter of the resident, at least numbers are dated, so forgive me, about a quarter of the total residential property values within the city and two thirds of your commercial industrial property are within 
in the city. Uh, and we do that at ISO rating of three, uh, which is a pretty good number. Uh, so that's our request briefly on the, the fire department is to be treated the same. Does that make sense or any questions on that? So in this is you're asking for the same that we give to each fire department in our county? Yes, yeah, sir. For, for a base level that the, that the county, the county provides money toward fire service for everyone except for your county residents that live within the city the county only puts five thousand dollars toward that currently and my our request would be to go to the same level that you provide everyone else and we will provide extra because we choose to tax ourselves to have that at the city level but if the county is going to provide fire service or money toward fire service for everyone the request would be that we be treated the same because we're paying pardon why the four basics taxations for the city is Law enforcement, fire, water, sewer, and trash pickup. That's it. Now, if it's fire inside the city limits, that's where your taxation is put in by our city residents. Yeah. Okay. They have the option of whether they move to the city or county. Why should we bear the burden of paying out of our budget to the city for fire? Well, we look at it, look at it the other way around, Commissioner Johnson. I, I live on Broad Street. The way around. I'm looking at it for the taxpayer of the county. And I am a taxpayer in the county, and that's where I'm going. I live on Broad Street in Lynn Valley, and I pay taxes on your county tax rate. You take my tax dollars and apply it to every volunteer fire department in this county. And I appreciate what Chief Jones and the association does and what they do. And I appreciate the fact that, to my best of my understanding, that all the volunteer fire departments work well together and with the city fire department. So that's nothing against it. Chief Jones and the association, but I'm saying, you, you tax us for that. We get no value from that because you provide that to everyone else. We're asking for the same value that you give us, the same base level across the board. We're more willing to take the extra because we'll pay for the extra. But if the city of Elizabeth and dissolve tomorrow and the following day, the Elizabeth the Volunteer Fire Department showed up, they'd be over here asking for the same amount of money. What being, what being that the constituents are still the same, the people are still the same, and you're, you're taxing those folks to provide a level of service that we do not get any benefit from. Good around the subject, but that, no, that, that was that was square to it. I'm not, I'm not trying to dodge you. Thank you. Yes, I know they had the town hall meeting last night on the ARP funds. Uh, did you guys have a request on that? Or I know for the ladder truck, was we had portion or what, what was we it? did it. We're just looking for any kind of help. Put the, the number in. Two million, is that right? One and a half. But what, what, whatever. Look, we'll, we'll take anything we can get. Uh, yes. And for one clarification from last night, I know there was discussion on the water side. Uh, for clarification for those of you who were there, for those who weren't, there was a question on whether the county was going to spend its ARP money to make the match for the water side on TDEP. You know, if you've got water utilities that need to make a 20% match, whatever the number is. The city's going to make the match on its part. We put in for the TDEC portion for our county customer, not our city customer, but the ones that exist in the county. West Carter County, Watauga, Lynn Valley. All in all. We're willing to make the match out of our own money. For that. So I know that was a bit of a tangent. So. Yeah, that was like two million or so. Two point six. And then we'll make the match on top of that. Because the project's about six point three. We're going to cover the rest of it with our own money. Yes. Anything else on the fire department? I don't think we're going to put another part there. The lights here. Come on up, Mike. Thank you. I, I, and, you know, I'm going to be brief as well. I, I think this binder goes into a lot of information that you need. So we try to include everything in it. First of all, I appreciate this opportunity our department does. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with y'all tonight, and, and hopefully I can answer any questions you may have. But our allocation request is, is uh, the same as, as it has been. It's $25,000. Uh, we didn't increase it at all. And, and in your binder, you can see various uh, topics, uh, um, including a, the award request, the uh, our budget, goals and objectives, our master plan, and then the facilities. And uh, just give you a little bit of a closer look at what's been going on and that's the last um, uh, section in your binder. So I just want to cover that really quick with you. 
uh, and then we'll turn it over to the questions for me. Especially Vince, uh, I, I hope you're noticing all that we're doing in our community. Uh, I had a good friend of mine about, about three or four years ago that said to me that you've got the ability, your department has the ability to change our community. And, um, and we're trying to do that in a positive way, uh, trying to create a lot of benefits for families. And uh, we're very excited about what took place last year, including Cover Bridge Jams or, or concert nights uh, at Cover Bridge Park uh, during the spring and summer months. Then we had the Independence Day Celebration, which was a, a great event, I believe, for all of, of, of Carter County. I mean, we, I, I don't know how many thousands were here that night, but uh, it was incredible evening we had and we, and, and we truly enjoyed that. It was a pleasure to provide to, to, to all. Cover Bridge Days was another event that we took on this year. And again, uh, I think that uh, we made some good strides with that event and, and we were able to provide a lot of good services uh, to our citizens. Christmas at the Cover Bridge Park, and thanks to y'all with the ice rink and, and that uh, sponsorship of it. Uh, it was incredible too. We had uh, Christmas decorations that were in the park. Uh, our city council has helped fund that over the last several years. So this year, we'll again add more lights to, to that facility. And it's uh, been a great draw from throughout the region to Elizabeth. And the Splash of Franklin Pool, the Little on the Block, Family Valentine's Day Dance, and the Easter Egg Hunt. Those are other special events that we're doing uh, you know, throughout the year. Looking at larger scale items, the Cover Bridge uh, Park Improvements will be coming up. Hopefully, we actually have a meeting tomorrow uh, with, uh, uh, with regarding our LPRF grant, which is 500000 We see you match that. So we'll have about a million dollars to spend at that facility over the next two or three years. Development of outdoor recreation is something that y'all are fully aware of, and we appreciate the support you've given to us. Uh, and also the County Parks and Recreation, recreation Board, too, because I, I think if we have any identity at all uh, within Elizabeth and Carter County, it's, it's just that. We have natural resources that are there for us to develop and, and to create more in the way of recreation opportunities for our citizens, first and foremost, but then outside of that, uh, this whole, whole entire region. So, Sir Betsy's uh, rolling along. Uh, we actually have a report coming up probably within the next um, 30 to 45 days, which will get a good look at phase one. Uh, and we'll be sharing that with city council and with others within our community uh, at a first glance of what that's going to look like along possibly the uh, Tom and Doe Rivers. And that is for kayaking, canoeing, and other uh, water activities for it. So, it's something we're very excited about. The Hampton Watership Hiking, the hiking Trail, we continue our work on that too, uh, working with Carter County Parks and Recreation Board. Um, there would be, you know, we appreciate everything you're doing too. And so we're, you know, gradually taking steps in that direction. Uh, and our phase one trail expansion is actually going to get underway here soon for the next few weeks. And then, of course, we're looking at a phase two where we extend the uh, trail all the way up to the top of the mountain. So it's another thing that uh, is, we're all excited about. If we have some concerns, it's with facility needs, and this affects all of us. Not only for those in Elizabeth and those outside the city limits, our recreation center is, is a facility that's being used more and more. Uh, if any department in the city sees uh, the, the influx of new people okay, to our communities, we do. Uh, we're getting the phone calls, you know, do you have a, a pickleball program? What's that consist of? Do you have this and that? And so we've got to grow through the times and, and provide those needs of, for our citizens and hopefully we can work with y'all on to just that in the coming years. But the Recreation Center is a facility that's used uh, for basketball events, special events in our community. And uh, right now it's just, it's it's really it's got a lot of age on it. So we're looking at another option and hopefully that will come through and be very beneficial to all of our citizens. Uh, Franklin Pool is another one. Uh, our swimming pool facility, we put a splash pad in a couple of years ago. And so now we're looking at some major improvements up to about $350,000 to install a new surface to the pool itself. And that really covers about all I've got tonight. But uh, I could go on and on. I'd love to. Uh, if y'all have any questions for me at all, please call my office and I'd love to talk to you. But do you have any at this time? Any questions at all? Uh, one question. Uh, page 20, it says City Park, uh, Adult Athletic Field Netting System. Uh -huh. Which park is that? That would be one that can sell. Yeah. 
and that's something uh, we felt that resource you got in there looking at our master plan would be very beneficial for y'all. So there's just a lot of reading to it. So if you get a chance, just take a look at that. Uh, and, and that particular facility that you mentioned, Aaron, is, is one that, you know, we used to have a lot of adult play there on, at that site. And uh, once the jail was built, we had to move away from that area and, and just because balls kept hitting the side of the jail. So. Well, I, kind of, I know you've been letting the, what uh, the baseball, you triple S A or who is it that, that comes and yeah, the travel games. tournaments? Yes. So you, you letting them use your fields for that. What what kind of uh, money do you get back yeah, from from it? So so that, that's a great question. Why you ask? First and foremost, and, and Russ, you know this, you get a you get a lot of teams coming in here that eat at restaurants and they shop. And in fact, the thing was like two years ago, we had we had calls where we had restaurants in that area that ran out of food over the weekend because we just had so many teams in here playing. And so we rent those facilities out. And, and so in the rental process, you know, we'll get a couple thousand dollars for the rental itself. And then in this case, the first three rental uh, tournaments that we had went to the league itself as a fundraiser. And so, and then up now, like this past weekend, it we went to our department where it goes back in and, and you know, we'll pay for the different costs associated with maintenance needs we have. But that's a great thing. And, and it's something that's just opened up. Actually, when COVID was going on real heavy and, and everything else was shut down, we were we were having games, you know, at our fields. And it's something that uh, our council directs us to do. So, yeah. great. Yeah. And, and across the board, we're seeing more and more people using park facilities. And uh, so we know uh, trust me, our staff, we meet, uh, sometimes we pray, because we got a big responsibility, and we know that. Uh, you know, we have a big mission to provide, uh, uh, you, you know, those in our city and, and county as well. I mean, uh, it's it's uh, half the users, you know, are out, out, outside city limits. And so, uh, but we enjoy what we're doing, and I hope we're making a difference. Mr. Mike, would you address the... Uh under construction ball park at Gap Creek, which is just off of Mary Patton. And yes, sir. We are looking at for. Thank you for the question. We are looking at that currently now, especially in the form of possibly helping with some maintenance of that facility. That's something that was requested by the, the, the County Park and Recreation Board. So our staff is, is looking at coming up with the figures of cost estimates of how much it would cost for us to do that annually. And so we hope to provide that information to Mr. Estes and the city council and see where we go from there. But, you know, uh, in, in our plan, in our parks and recreation plan, one of the goals of objects is were to, to have a park on the west side of town. And so that meets that description right there. And of course, it includes a dog park, it includes adult field uh, that is needed because again, we can't, you know, we can't necessarily play at the city park because it's just not, the fences aren't long enough uh, to, to hold it there. But um, I, I think there will be more and more discussion about that facility. I know we've been uh, speaking a little bit with the project manager who sent us some information that we can look at and trying to determine how much it would cost annually to make that, maintain that facility. Uh, <coughs> um, well, Brad got one of my questions. The second one is, do you plan on doing phase two in, in FY23? At all at I'm sorry at Hampton Washes. We're in the budget process now. Yeah, we're so all trash. We, it, it currently is, you know, we're discussing that now. And then the second question is that we mentioned it last year. Have you ever identified any, any places in town for a skateboard park? We we've got one in mind right now. It is very close to here. Uh, and so we're trying to work on that, but uh, uh, it is that's the need that we've seen and we've identified it in the master plan. You, you know, our partner rec board. That's been one that they've had up in quite <coughs> some time. It just hasn't worked out. And and, and please understand, we, we want to do more, okay? And yet we're asking for 25 in, in this budget. But there's some major projects here. There's a surf Bessie, which is like three and a half million. It could be more than that. But you talk about a great impact you can have on Elizabeth and Clark County. And then you've got the Hampton Trails. And then you have Cover Ridge Park. And, and uh, then the Recreation Center. <laughs> I have never had, uh, never seen so many great projects that are on the table that we could really uh, make an impact on in our community. So 
yeah, our request is 25, but, you know, I hope we can work together in the future because it's, it's just, you know, we, I mean, I live, you know, on Burton Street right now, and I don't see it as a city county thing, especially in recreation. Um, we, we, our mission is to serve everybody, as many people as we can. And that's what we need to do. So we hope y'all come along on board with some of the social stuff too down the road. That's really the challenge that you face, Mike, is it's not that we have a lack of things we could do or ideas that are possibilities. It's really we have so many possibilities that you really just have to sit down and prioritize what you can do. And sometimes it's it's financing is a limitation, but also really staff time and ability to manage and keep your eye on things is, is a limitation as well. And I Speaking for myself, not for Mike, I, I would be interested to see, you know, where the opportunities lie. Uh, I appreciate what the County Park Rec Board has done and is doing. Uh, those, those are good things. But by extension, I would be interested in hearing what the commission at large, I know this is just a third of you uh, here on the budget committee, but writ large, where the commission is as a funding body, what your vision is for, for the park and rec space. If, that, if, if any of that overlaps with us, I think the opportunity is there for us to have a conversation about how do you, how do you push in the same direction? There will be places where they don't. If it's other things that come along and priority you have, or whether the city has it or they don't, or what we have and you don't have that same priority, that's okay. That, that's just the nature of how things are. I mean, you, know, you have a broader scope than we do uh, just on length <laughs> geographically, but I think there's plenty of places where we, where we overlap. And again, if we can see ourselves as being in the same boat and just decide to row in the same direction together, I think that we have some opportunities and again that's the conversation back to your one on the budget now we've not set the budget i've not made a presentation yet to the council on a preliminary budget let alone anything on capital uh, we don't have the operating budget set actually we'll send something out to them in draft form soon uh, but that's just the operating budgets nothing on capital yet uh, so i know y'all are having this conversation obviously what you're doing tonight is trying to get the ball rolling on your budget we're trying to do the same and i think the opportunity there is for us to communicate and see where we are uh, my Twitchy Trail Park is listed on here. Which park is that? Is that the one down there next to Wilson's Barbershop near Gun Depot? Yes. yes. A small uh, pocket park area that we have there. So uh, we, it, it's just tough to develop that area because you've got to get out on the uh, 321 right there. And it, it's tough to do that. So, um, you know, it's, uh, so we're trying to, to create a park there with people with Twitchy Trail users. But again, uh, you, you know, and I want to go back to this. Uh, <coughs> We have a fantastic opportunity coming up. We really do. And, and you, you know, I know that we can work together. Our staff can. The vision that we have is similar to what, what the county has. It's developed the outdoor recreation aspect. And my goodness, it would be so beneficial for our citizens first and foremost. I always say that. But this region, I mean, Johnson City would love to have two rivers going through their town. They would. And so what we got is, is, is just a, a special gift. And we just got to tap into a user. Well, I'll say this and commend you guys. I know you got a lot dumped on you with the chamber and taking on the Christmas parade and the uh, covered bridge and all that. I know you guys had your hands full. I thought, I thought it went well last year. You did a good job on that. Thank you. Appreciate that. They're getting bigger this year, too, especially covered bridge days. Can't wait to, to share what's going on with that soon. Good stuff. Thank you so much. Appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I don't think anybody's here from me, so we're going to check them off and see. Uh, anybody from the Tennessee Department of Agriculture? Yeah. 21st, okay. Uh, Act and Extension? Um, 
Well, I'm, I'm trying to get towards that that's requested that has that they've got other things they have to get out here a little early. Or and then we're going to start with the toss. So the next will be the American Red Cross after that. First of all, did everybody get a presentation sheet for keeping everything up? I think uh, everybody here knows who we are. I was here last month introducing myself as a new chair, Keep Perry County Beautiful. Um, you know of our activities. Uh, just as a reminder, just February and March, we've already had three events uh, trying to help the county and the city out. Uh, we went out to the Little Milligan boat ramp, Otago Lake, and we uh, cleaned out 4,600 pounds trash out of the lake, um, identified several areas that uh, need further cleanup. Um, we'll be working with Keep Tennessee River uh, in beautiful in the future. Uh, we want to make sure that our lakes and streams and rivers are kept um, as beautiful as we can. Uh, we did some Otago River cleanup. Uh, we've identified an area on the Otago River here at Blevins Road that has a uh, hundred tired plus tires in it. We removed about half of those. Um, we just last Saturday planted 30 trees on the Tweetsie, Tweetsie Trail. Our vision on the Tweetsie Trail is uh, to plant a tree everywhere we can plant a tree. We would like uh, tourists, businesses, and the residents to be coming down the Tweetsie Trail and see flowering trees in the spring foliage in the fall turning colors, just beautify and make it look um, uh, as best we can. Uh, on the Watauga River, um, we're also looking at cleanups on Levens Road on the, in the fish camp area there. We want to make sure that we keep the roads that are accessing our waterways um, nice and clean. We want, to, we want as many tourists and residents to enjoy the facilities and the, and the countryside we've got, hills, mountains, forests, wildlife. On that chart that you're looking at, um, you'll see our activities for the last three years. You'll see we're down slightly from the pandemic. We plan on being up uh, in the 20 event uh, again this year. Um, the beautification projects are usually the uh, costliest of our events. Uh, because we have a very high and strong volunteer base that provides the labor for these things. So the funds we're looking for this year, $7,000, will go for uh, beautification trees, flowers, plants. Uh, we've got wildflower uh, pots planned. We also have cleanup events every year. We've got um, almost a dozen cleanup events this year. Anybody drives 321 from Johnson City to Elizabethan or Elizabethan to Johnson City, you know what that looks like when we get later in the year, especially when the lawn's not being cut uh, or it's been cut for the last time. We get tourists and businesses coming in and out of there. The last thing I think we want them to see is a lot of trash. We want them to come in, see a nice clean road, come into our parks, come into our waterways, come into our roads and see nice, clean, beautiful roads. I live, uh, for those who don't know, I live over in um, Quail Hollow subdivision. And I can tell you right now, over the last year and a half, we've had a dozen new residents from out of state move in. I'm one myself, a transplant, we're adding to the tax base and we're, we're coming here because it's such a beautiful Garland has a trasher size container on his a drinking container on his thing. Um, you can see that the dollar value that we provide to the community far is in excess of what we're asking for funding. Um, two bullet points on the bottom of the chart there will tell you a little bit more about what we do. And um, the last bullet point there I want to talk about is we lost our secretary last year. Um, she had some family issues and uh, needed to attend to those. We had plans on working with the chamber to pay uh, 
a small amount of money for a salary for a secretary that could help us out with the flyers, the grants, our nonprofit documentation and things like that. Um, we are fortunate that we had someone step up as a volunteer who has a master's of business and is helping us with all the secretary of the functions now. So we did reclaim the money that was going to be paid to the salary. Um, we can reclaim that money and it's in beautification and it's going to work with trees and flowers and plants. Um, you'll see us all over this county, Ripshin Mountain, Rome Mountain, Otago Lake, um, Otago River, Elizabeth, and um, we have no limits on where we're going in the county. Um, any questions at all I can answer? Uh, if not, I'd like to see everybody in this room maybe out at our next event. I mean, I'll say, of course, I earned that right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. You did. You're an active member of this group and on the board of directors. If you will, well, I'll say this, that none of this money goes to any paid positions. It's a completely yes. volunteer organization. Absolutely. That, that's why I brought up the secretary's position. That would have been the first time any money at all went to an individual in the salary. We were glad to recoup that. I'm glad we do not have to pay that because now we can maintain our 100% volunteer status. Every dime that we're funded with goes right smack back in the community, plus all the free labor from the volunteers that are out there. Uh, we have a very large base of volunteers. Not all of them work at every event. We get anywhere between 10 and 20 volunteers at each event. We have 31 bags off of Milligan Highway uh, in February. 31 bags of trash. 23 tires out of Otago Lake. Where the tires are coming from, we're trying to find out right now. Work with you guys, the law enforcement, to find out where this trash is coming from. We go into schools. We do have presentations for schools, uh, elementary schools, high schools. Um, we did the presentation all, all over the county, trying to educate people that. This litter is a problem, not just for the people littering in terms of fines and in law enforcement. It's a problem for all of us. When I started coming down here four or five, well, actually eight years ago now, one of the things I was looking for is a community that was clean and beautiful. I came from Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I will tell you, it wasn't the main reason, but one of the reasons I moved out of Michigan was the sheer overlook the trash on the roads and in the water. Came down here, we started driving around the county, came right here to Carter County, saw what we wanted to see. At that time, the roads were clean and beautiful. I don't know whether I just hit a lucky spot on 321 when they had just cut the lawn or something, but um, it, they were a lot nicer than I've ever seen in my home state. This is my home now. So this being my home, I want to to keep it as beautiful as we can do. So if anybody's got any questions at all, uh, our website is on here. You can see all the things we're doing on that website. <clears throat> Educating recycling, composting. Um, we're multi-pronged approach to try to make sure that any tourism that comes to our, our beautiful mountains are coming here, spending their dollars. Any businesses that want to relocate, we're trying to make them come here. So, any questions? No question, but if you will add the money, these funds you're requesting going to beautification, we used those 30 trees this past Saturday. What was the value of that? Because that was money that came from the, the trees cost the beautiful. The trees cost $4,740 last week year. We got a 5,000 donation uh, last year, our funding from the county. So almost every dime of your county funding uh, bought 30 trees and the labor was free to plant those. If you go down Elk Avenue and you get uh, between Freddy's and the PCN, you can see those trees, they were just planted. Um, we're fortunate that our Elizabeth and Fire Department is helping us out in keeping them watered the first year so that we don't make sure we don't lose any of them. The plan is trees the entire length of the Tweetsie Trail, especially in the city of Elizabethan, because we want to make sure everybody sees this as the gateway to the community. 
And I think it'd be fair to mention that that was a collaboration. City of Elizabeth and Parks and Rec was part of that. Megan uh, had an hour of landscape, and I don't know the name of it exactly. But we get we get very good support from the county in terms of um, landfill. Denny Lyons helps us out. Dumpsters. I mean, if we pick up all this trash, we don't have anywhere to put it. I said that last time. Um, what are we going to do? So Benny's helping us out with that. We get litter pickup. We can get certain supplies, garbage bags, gloves from T dot. Uh, but what we can't get is um, specific safety vests for trash sizing. We can't get grabbers for picking up trash. We're trying to outfit everybody that wants one with a grabber and a safety vest. You go out your front door in the morning, you see trash, pick it up. We're trying to get back to the vision of the property, the street in front of your house or in front of your business is your responsibility as a good citizen. Um, we're going to be working with more businesses this year. Hopefully uh, get them identify the, the fact that the trash in front of their street, in front of their business is something they can help us out with and pick up. And it'll serve us their community. Go into a restaurant. I don't know about the rest of you, but I go into a restaurant, the parking lot's filthy. I turn around and go away. So. And again, I, I like what you said, Ross. I want to stress that every dime of funding we get goes right back into the community. Not a single dime is spent on anything that isn't community based. Just to confirm, you said your ask for this year was seven. seven. <coughs> What you guys do is amazing. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Thank you. All right, next up, we will have the American Red Cross. Good evening, everyone. My name is Heather Carvajal and I'm the Executive Director for the American Red Cross of Northeast Tennessee. This is also my second time presenting to you all, so it's nice to see some familiar faces. Um, we're asking for $4,000 in support. This is the same amount that we've requested last year to go directly towards our direct financial assistance for our disaster. In times of house fires or other disasters, the Red Cross responds immediately. And we have a two-hour timeline, and that, that two hours is pretty generous. We're usually there while the fire department is still on scene. And our role is to provide immediate needs for family members, making sure they have somewhere safe to go. They have the ability to purchase food for their family, to purchase clothes. As I'm sure you guys know, fires don't normally hit when it's sunny at 75. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. Families come out. Sometimes they have shoes on, pajamas. So we bring blankets, toys for the children so they have a comfort item hygiene kits for the families so that they're able to take a shower once they get to wherever they're going, snacks and water for that human comfort. And from there, we work with each family for around 30 to 60 days, depending on the case, to make sure that they're able to recover. So we don't just come in, say, here's your, here's your immediate assistance and best of luck. We're helping them put the pieces back together so that they know they have somebody to talk to, to replace their birth certificate to replace their car keys that have burned, to help their kids get clothes for school, to connect to long-term crisis counseling if there's a need. Anything that may come up during the process, help them find long-term housing. That's been a barrier that we're really facing, especially over the last couple of years. Anytime there's that injury where somebody's hospitalized, we coordinate hospital visits, whether they are here in Knoxville. We see a lot of people who might have going to um, favor the or Trauma. We coordinate with local volunteers wherever those people are so that they're able to get that human comfort and know that somebody is there caring about them. We provide disaster mental health, so it's like crisis support as well as spiritual care. So if somebody isn't comfortable saying, yeah, you can call a therapist, we can call a pastor. They, for whatever denomination you are, and have them come and pray with you. This is especially crucial when we have children who've been affected by fire. We see a lot of kids who have a fire who now are not sleeping very well um, and connect them to longer-term counseling. 
We also help with medical equipment. So we're not first responders. We're not going to be able to patch somebody up. But what we can do is help with lost medicine. We've seen a lot of um, people, and I believe I said this last year, because it just is an ongoing challenge in need of nebulizers. If somebody loses an inhaler or loses their glasses, the Red Cross steps in to help with the cost of those when we're not responding to fires, we're out in the community educating on disaster preparedness. So we work with children. This year we worked with Happy Valley for disaster education, kindergarten through fifth grade. So we teach fire safety as well as a local hazard. So we're talking a lot about flooding and tornadoes in this area. We also teach adults. We've worked recently with the Elizabethton Senior Center to make sure that our local seniors are prepared for an emergency, that they have the things they would need to stop an emergency kit and that they're able to be independent for about three days maximum than needed. So I know we were asked to keep it brief, so at that point I'll stop and take any questions you guys have. You guys still do the uh, smoke detectors? We for do. Home? We do. I will say that our smoke, our fire, our smoke alarm program, excuse me, uh, has been limited over the last couple of years, but we're getting back into the community we're doing those appointment-based alarms, so I'm going to ask that you guys and also everyone who's listening, if you know someone who needs smoke alarms, if you need smoke alarms, we'll come and install them for free. We'll replace any alarms that you guys have. If they're older than 10 years, you really should be replacing those. We'll come in and take care of that for free at a time that's convenient to you. Are you guys also doing a program for schools? So we work with Happy Valley this year, um, but we are always open to requests. If there are any other schools that would want to work with us, we reach out. We try to reach out to schools in all of our counties every year. Um, so next year we may be working with Elizabeth Elementary or Butler Elementary uh, to see to educate on disaster preparedness. That being said, if you guys know of a school that you particularly like to see us at, please let us know and we'll make sure to prioritize that. Sure. So if it, it does not, if it comes from Carter County, from the Carter County Commission, it will, it will go towards Carter County funding. If let's say I made a donation to the Red Cross as an individual donor, I would want to designate that where I wanted that to go. So I might say I want it to go wherever it needed most or to local fire responses, services to the armed forces, those sorts of things. But County Commission funds always stay in that county. I'd just like to address the comments in support of the American Red Cross because basically three great functions that the majority of people in the county do not realize. First one, as a young man in military service, Red Cross is always the one that your military commands makes contact with, make contact with the family, whether it's in sickness, whether it's in death, whatever it is. They're the center hub. And secondly, being retired from this county as a an investigator, I worked over uh, 187 fires in this county, and the majority of the fires came at nighttime when we're all safe in bed. And as the law officer on the scene, it was always refreshing, just out of the wild blue yonder, like Nurse Nightingale. You always find that shoulder patch with the Red Cross on it that's there to take the victims or, you know, the people who lost their homes. They've lost everything. The only thing you have is a shirt on their back. And they, for four and sometimes extended that, days following that, they paid the expense of the hotels, the food, the transportation, the medical, everything is related to it. So if you correlate all of that service, with what the request is, uh, it's unbelievable what they perform. Now, one of the other that you're more aware of is a natural disaster. Uh, Military-wise, the hurricanes that goes through the Gulf, uh, we participated in that. But here alone in the 90s, when we had the massive flood that destroyed uh, a lot of Rome Mountain down through Hampton, through Valley Forge and all, guess who was on the spot first with all the all their support? And, it, it, you know, sometimes I wonder if they even have a speech impediment because they don't speak. They just work. 
and I appreciate it. I appreciate that. Thank you for your service. I didn't mention it in our application because we're not requesting funding for it, but we are the only agency in the country who can contact soldiers regardless of where they're deployed for an emergency. So if there's a, a loss of a loved one or a birth of a new family member, we're able to verify that information and advocate to get your soldier home. So thank you for mentioning that. Thank you so much. And if there's any opportunity for me to come and talk to your church about <laughs> or education or Rotary, whoever it may be, I always say I'm happy to, but somebody please take me up on it this year. Thank you, guys. All right, next we'll have the East Tennessee Spain letter. Hi, I'm Priscilla Davis of the East Tennessee Spain letter, and this is my first time ever hearing for me to request an assistance. We are a low-income spay and neuter program. Uh, we offer substantial discounts to what you would pay if you go to a vet clinic. Our full price for our uh, dogs are $70, female cats are $65, and male cats are $50. This includes surgery and a rabies shot, which is a great deal for most of us. However, a lot of folks in Carter County really don't have that much extra money lying around. So we are requesting $2,500 from you to go directly towards spay and neuter for low-income Carter County residents. Low-income, they must be between 30, under $30,000 a year. We do verify that they are Carter County residents, and we do verify their income. Uh, we have requested the same amount from the city. Uh, we have a matching donor that's a nonprofit that will match everything that you give us. So if you give us $2,500, they will give us $2,500. If the city gives us $2,500, then, you know, we'll get $2,500 from there. So that's a lot of money. If we do get this money, we will have a minimum discount of $25 per pet. And it may be more depending on uh, the amount of money that we get. A few years ago, we had a very generous donor in Carter County donate a thousand low cost, ten dollars spay and neuters for residents of Carter County only. We did have to verify that. Uh, we used Margaret B. Mitchell Spay and Neuter Clinic in Bristol, Virginia, for the only low cost spay and neuter clinic that's around. Uh, basically, we collect the money from the people as they file an application, and then the clinic bills us, so we pay the difference. for the increase. All right. Thank you, Jim. Oh, sorry. No, I just, we got to thank you guys for, for volunteering your time and effort and I mean, your lives for saving people. And, and we appreciate that. Well, thank you for all what you do to help us. All right, next we'll have the RSVP.
No, it's the retirement senior culture program. Now it's called the Upper East. Yes. Okay. They're uh, now known as the Upper East. Okay. Sorry. You were fine. Upper East. Upper East. Upper East to the Human Development Agency. That's us. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We. Uh, they discontinued. We don't have the RSVP program anymore. So when we were here, that program, uh, they did away with that program because of, uh, we weren't getting the funding we needed and our agency couldn't operate it anymore. When I was here in December, we took that money that you all gave to RSVP and you let us use it for our community services. From the agency where we serve low income families, and uh, we just converted that money. We're back now asking you for that four thousand that you normally give to RSVP to let us use that. <coughs> we, uh, when we were here before and we got that money, we've been able to serve 24 households, 57 individuals. Uh, We've done things like housed homeless family. We paid their rent in their first month's deposit and their electric deposit. Uh, we've helped people with electric assistance, which has been really the main thing. A lot of our, we received state and federal funding has a lot of restrictions. So people in your county that we cannot help because they don't fall into those restrictions the state and the federal government requires of us. So with these local funds, we're able to help those people. With the huge increase in electric bills that we see, uh, just all of a sudden it hit a lot of elderly folks <coughs> that don't have children, did not qualify. We were able to, because of your funding, able to keep the lights on for, I think we, 15 families. That includes some of those with children. And uh, that was a lifesaver to a lot of us. Kept them warm in those cold snap. We appreciate that. They appreciate that. And we're just asking you to let us do it again. I noticed you, you've got just 2000 for rent, 2000 for electric. How do you bet those families that come through? Okay. <coughs> collect a lot of documentation. Anything that the state requires us to have on a family, we do it the same for your funding. Uh, we feel like if they, that's the documentation they require for us to vet them, we apply that same standard to your money. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing's done without documentation. <laughs> Lots of documentation. <laughs> Thank you. Next up is the Children's Advocacy Center. Hello, my name is Samantha Frater. I'm the Executive Director of the Children's Advocacy Center of the First Judicial District. Um, I think you guys have some information. Um, <coughs> brief synopsis of what we do. Um, we serve the First Judicial District, which is Carter, Washington, Johnson, and Unicoi counties, and we provide um, child abuse prevention services for children and their families in severe physical abuse and sexual abuse um, investigations. We work with our multidisciplinary team partners, which is the district, district attorney's office, Department of Children's Services, uh, law enforcement, city and county from all four counties, uh, TBI, FBI, Homeland Security, uh, Frontier Health, ETSU Pediatrics and juvenile court from all uh, four counties. Five juvenile court, so. um, 
We provide forensic interviewing, trauma-focused therapy services, forensic medical exams, and advocacy services for children who have been severely abused. Um, we also do education programs in schools for internet safety, <coughs> body safety, and um, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a complete blank here. Um, schools, churches, daycares, that kind of thing, and all of this is done at no cost. We're primarily funded by um, federal and state grants. However, that does not cover everything. Um, and we have to make up for that with uh, local government um, fundraising and donations. As far as local government goes, we are funded by presently Carter County, Elizabethan City, Town of Unicoi, Unicoi, Irwin, Johnson County, and that's it. So, um, you guys have supported us in the past. We're asking if the same amount that we got last year. Um, and I know you guys wanted us to keep it brief. So, are there any questions that anybody has? Is there approximately how many children does the uh, district handle? Um, with within all four counties, um, we get about seven to eight hundred referrals a year, and then we provide services to around four hundred of those. Um, and depending upon the abuse allegation, that kind of decides whether or not we're going to provide services. Uh, we do a lot with drug exposed children, but generally they are infants, so kind of limits what we can actually do with those families. It's hard to provide service to a child that's a week old. Your central location is in Johnson City, if I read this right. Yes. Yes, downtown Johnson City. Do you have overnight facilities or do you all take it outside of your own? We, we do not provide any overnight um, accommodations for anyone. What's the age range? Sorry. Go ahead. Is that just under 18, basically? Or? Um, generally, we like to do about 3 to 18. Under 3, it's very difficult for the child to um, participate in the interview. Okay. <laughs> I can't remember what it was. Anyone else? Would you guys do? Yeah, we really appreciate you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yes, it is. Okay, thank you guys so much for your support in the past and hopefully in the future, and you all have more. Thank you. All right, do we have anybody here from the Imagination Library? Okay. Uh, yes, Mr. Hicks is here. Okay. Hicks. Hey, nobody. Good evening. I'm here on behalf of the Imagination Library tonight, and uh, personally, I would like to thank you for your service to Card County. I know sometimes it's a thankless job, uh, but I'm happy that we have people doing well and good. And uh, I think you do a good job. On behalf of the Imagination Library, I would like to thank you for the fine manner in which you have supported the local Imagination Library through the years, and uh, we are hoping you will continue to support it. We are not asking for an increase. We might 
funded at the same level as we have received the past few years. Uh, I will share with you a little information and I'll try to keep this brief. We have served since Carter County Elizabeth and the Imagination Library came into existence, we have provided books for 392,427. Now, that's not the number of children. We've provided that number of books to children at Carter County. If you're not familiar with the program, and there are probably are very few people who aren't familiar because most of you, it's received a lot of publicity, and most of you have had children who participated in Imagination Library, or if you're older, like myself, you had grandchildren who have participated in Imagination Library. And uh, children, from the time they are born until they uh, end their fifth year, receive a book per month. Now, those are actually mailed out in six mailings per year, so children receive uh, two months' worth of books in, in one mailing. Uh, the books begin with The Little Engine That Could, which, uh, and this, uh, by the way, is a 90, uh, 90th anniversary commemorative copy, and it holds special meaning for me because it was the first, not from the Dolly Park Imagination Library, but it was the first book my mother ever read to me. And it was the one that was my favorite when I was growing up. The last book in the series that uh, children get is Look Out Kindergarten, Here I Come. Uh, now, we are currently sending books to 2,155 children in Carter County uh, with each mailing. Now, in the packet that I've given you, there is some information. I won't try to go over this tonight. If you look at this and you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Uh, you can reach me at uh, Area code 423-767-5744, or you can call Ashley Williams at the local library. Uh, and the truth of the matter is, Ashley knows a whole lot more about the program than I do. Uh, but uh, do you have any questions tonight I can answer? If not, thank you. And again, we appreciate your support. Uh, you've been one of our view in the city of Elizabeth and have both been faithful supporters since the formation of the organization. Right, next up we have kids like us. Thank you for having us tonight. Uh, as you know, last year, kids like us was relocated to Sullivan County due to our COVID being so we to recovery soldiers minister at the old man. So um, we had a gentleman in Sullivan County that was gracious enough to buy Holston Valley Middle School and give it to us to use. So we have been very fortunate there. Uh, however, we do service the Tri City still. We have um, in the past been a nonprofit, but this year we decided to seek licensure so that we can support more kids because we were limited to four hours a day being able to be there. This is our summer program for the year. We will be there 6.30 to 6.30, which will accommodate working parents, which we've never really been able to do in the past. We currently have 75 children from Carter County enrolled in the summer program. Now our target is mainly special needs, but we do have other kids and siblings that are kind of about having a disability as well. Uh, we will drive a bus up to Food City, which will be a pickup and a drop off location from eight to four if they need that. Um, and that's the majority of the ones that we are having in 
will fall so that the parents won't be having to transport back and forth. We also have seek licensure when the free license with process and should be licensed within the next 30 days to be an early learning center. Early Learning Center continues to be a nonprofit with the target is those babies that are born to NAS to work with the children that can't go to a traditional daycare that they're not equipped to handle the needs and medical requirements for these children and to also work with the families as a whole so that we can bring them break life cycles. We have partnered with ETSU on this program for the next five years to do a research project with them to show that, um, that we can help with those kinds of issues. Uh, we currently have 170 enrolled, but we I got an email today that we have been cleared to have 363. So that was wonderful news today. Uh, all of the money that has been allocated by Carter County in the past has went to the Carter County students and will continue to do so. We funded it this year. Uh, we have different uh, allocations set with each county so that the money goes to, to those students that, that will be attending. As of today, we still have no paid staff. We will be hiring some staff for the summer due to the increase of enrollment and the special needs of some one-on-one -on -one that's going to be required to some of our students that will be attending. But up to now, we have never had a paid staff member. It's been solely on volunteers and students and interns. Any questions? <coughs> Any questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, next up, we have the Isaiah House. Uh, the Shepherd's Inn. First off, I thank you for inviting me to come over and be with you this afternoon and this evening. When she came to the shelter, she brought two little guys with her, toddlers. They were with us for about a week. Couldn't find the perpetrator. She beat her up pretty badly. And result, within a week and a half later, police were able to find him, or Carter County Sheriff's Department was able to find him. He had committed suicide and left a note. In that note, he said, I plan to have taken all of you with me. That was the first admission to Shepherd's Inn 25 years ago. In May of 25, in May of this year, we will begin our 25th year. We are here because of the thousands of people that have come through the doors. We have worked with those who were trying to escape domestic violence or otherwise for temporarily homelessness. They couldn't, they couldn't find a place to go. This community has been responsible. And I've been privileged to be a part of that program from its inception. What we do, it's obvious you've got the material. You can see we do it for a very low price. And the last two years have been very challenging for us as it has been for everybody with COVID. It's been quite a chore because we've had to change our admissions policies as has been dictated by the severity of the disease. I'm hoping Great. Fingers crossed that we can continue with an open policy of helping people as we have in the past, but we've had to be careful. Fortunately, the women and children who come to shelter, there's been no one who's contracted COVID in this past two years. And I knock on wood, praise the heavens for that. So I want to thank you, first off, for what you have provided for us because you pay the house payment every year. We're, not at, we're asking for the same amount of $12,000. And that'll be applied the day that we get that. It'll be deposited, and I take the check over to Carter County Bank and thrilled to pay it a year in advance. So we don't have to worry about that particular that, that particular over amount that we need to raise money for. We've not been able to do fundraisers. You all came ahead for us. 
Thank you. I know the child advocacy crew and Shepherds Inn are very grateful for the funds that were provided through the for the court system that, that helped us tremendously. Uh, and we share those funds with the court system, and we appreciate that so much. The budget you see is not really a good budget because it's hard to indicate how many people we're going to have next year. I will tell you that we have already we have more than we anticipated for right now. So. Um, Domestic violence is an insidious disease. I don't need to tell you that it's involved. It's not fun. But I will also tell you that the women and children that come there, they we connect them with, of course, safety first. We work with them very closely with getting jobs, making certain that they take an order of protection, which we did this afternoon on one case. Um, and as you know, it is a Totally protected property. I cannot disclose, disclose the location. I can tell you privately and you sign a waiver, as do every officer that brings somebody to the Shepherd's Inn. Thank you for your faith in us. Thank you for your faith in, in this work that's done and for the thousands of women and children who have come through our doors. Many, many meals have been served. It's because of friends like you, this community, that we've been able to do that. And I know the board of directors joined me in thanking you and with their hands out saying, we need it again this coming year. So we can pay the house payment when that comes in in October. And that's my presentation. Do you have any questions? Questions? We went through the blood of the COVID-19, particularly last year. Did you all see an increase in the domestics that were referred to your office facility? You know, it was an interesting, it was an interesting study almost. At the beginning of the COVID, when it was announced in January, you know, that we were having it, we had an increase. It was dramatic. We were full. And then as it progressed, um, our house doctor is Dr. May, Stephen May, who's head of the CDC. And he advises us what to do, and, and rightfully so. And we had to adjust our our call. You know, we couldn't admit everybody that wanted to come in after a while. Then the numbers dropped down. It has truly been a weird thing because I've been doing this for 25 years now, and I've seen, you know, there's been some stability in calls. It all somewhat increased from outside the area, but inside the area, it is, I have a theory on that. And I talked with Kathy Walsh, who's the head of the state coalition of this. Because we're a rural community, think about it. If you have had a perpetrator in your house, if they're not going to work, it's pretty hard to get to that phone and call 911. And I think that we've had a lot of abuse that went on without us them being able to communicate with us. So, you know, it's going to be, you know, we'll see this more as the time wears on down the road. I think we're already beginning to see it on this end. So it's a lot well, bigger than since everybody's locked up at home. Yeah. Between the head, the two heads will come together more often because they're going to get on each other's patients. Normally, the results of it winds up in your facility. It does. And then we work very closely with everybody. You know, it's part of human services, the, uh, child protection agencies, on and on and on. We, we're with everybody. Part of county school system. What a wonderful program that we work with. Because those kids can't get to school, they get the material to us. Those are the city schools, as well as the sheriff's department, the city police. We're all in tandem working with these folks. So we, we can be proud of the fact that the community comes together to make certain these Folks' needs are bad. Thank you. If there's any questions, please know that we're there and we're glad to answer them anytime. What's your policy on the, since Dr. May is there, what is your policy on accepting women that come in if they're not vaccinated? Are they allowed to stay overnight? Here's here's how we've been doing it for the last few months. And I anticipate with my board meeting next week, we're going to change that again because we changed it a lot. We had to go to the thing when the, uh, when the, uh, the variant came out, this last one came out. We found ourselves, the board said, we better be careful. It was recommended that we only take those who are fully vaccinated. Now there's an exception to that. When a police officer walks into a home and they can't find the guy, he's not been vaccinated, <coughs> we still take him in, okay? If somebody calls me from, from Rogersville, as they did last week, and they've not been vaccinated, we're not gonna try to do that. We're gonna try to connect them with some other agency that has the facility to house them separately from anybody else. So we can take we do take people in if they were not vaccinated, and um, there's not many. If it's community wise, 
I, I take those first. If they're out of this area, I try to find out some other place for them to go to. You know, so it's it's a little it's a little tricky, but we want to take care of our community. With the, the facility that the last time I was with it was at the VA ground for domestic abuse. Is it still operational? Safe there? Passage is operating, but it's operating under a different title now, and it's uh, it's it's at a separate location. So we, and we do have reciprocity. We work very closely with all these other shelters. Thank you. You're, 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 you're doing yeoman's work in here. Believe me, <laughs> try to separate all this out. I appreciate it. Thank you. Next up, we'll have the loaves and fish. Fish is outreach. I do have some a few. Since I've seen in the paperwork, I'm Serena Miller and um, I'm the director at Lowe's and Fishes on 19 uh, We're a, we're a food, uh, we get about food and we do hot meals four nights a week. Um, our And um, we went from five nights a week to four nights a week, and you can look and see that our numbers didn't change very much uh, because our numbers are increasing nightly. Um, there has been, um, as you know, an increase in food prices. Uh, second Harvest, which um, I don't know if you guys know or not, but has started charging us for food to the grants and things so the only thing we get free now food wise is usda so uh we came with you with the same amount but there's been a lot of changes um i feel like that you all could give us more we would appreciate it because we just um bruce plant replaced the 800 hot water heater took 1700 to fix one of our commercial freezers um, food like i said we're having to buy um, our numbers are increasing and it's because we have a lot of grandparents coming through with grandchildren and they're living on their social security checks and they just can't afford the food like they used to. Almost nightly I have somebody in tears saying I don't know what I would do without you guys because I can't have to feed my babies. You know, They didn't expect to have to be raising these grandchildren and they are, so I feel like that's a lot of our people. We, we fit very few, I, I know it's the rumor that we feed the homeless, I probably get two, maybe three homeless people a week. These are people who just can't make it. Um, people who've lost their jobs, people who have inherited children due to drugs and alcohol abuse in the family. Um, and the numbers, like right now, our boxes are pitiful of food because we, you know, we were giving out probably about 40 pounds of food because Second Harvest was giving us a lot of the food. You can see the numbers probably changed there on the, the food went from like 47,000 to 20,000 pounds. But we, um, we're, we're trying to make it work. We're trying to get more things involved for Food City. We'll donate some of their outdated items. Um, we just got on board with two of the Dollar Generals to give us their outdated food items that are still okay to, to use. Um, but, you know, with all the cost of just maintaining everything, you know, our light bill, we pay three-fourths of the light bill for the church because the church only has one service a week and we are there four nights a week. Well, I'm usually there five, six nights a week myself, but... Um, you know, our light bill is sometimes $1,800, $1,900 a month, water bill. Um, we have to find somebody who can work on these $800 hot water heaters. It, it, it was from 1974, and it had so much sediment in it, it took three men to get it up from the basement at the flight of steps. So I have volunteers who do this work, and sometimes we have to pay people because it's, I mean, it's a lot of work. Um, I myself spend about 50 to 60 hours a week trying to keep everything running. Uh, I'm, the only thing that I'm asking for is to keep us going. Keep, you know, I want these people to have enough food uh, for their families. Um, it's not, we are not enabling anybody. I know that's kind of been said. 
we have new people every night. As a matter of fact, last night I, I left as this, they were starting tonight, but they were already lined up in two lines around the parking lot. Um, last night I met three new families and, um, one was because they just moved to the area and they moved into public housing and then they um, weren't able to just weren't able to get established with their food. And um, I've had so many people bring me their letters from the food stamp office saying your benefits are cut because the pandemic over and your new food stamps are $24 a month. I don't know about you guys, but $24 doesn't go very far for the month. Um, we don't get a lot of milk and bread, the, you know, the things that they need, you know, the daily necessities that we don't think a whole lot about going out and getting. Um, so what we're giving them, you know, is a lot of boxed foods, a lot of canned goods. And if we get meat right now, the only meat we've been able to get from second harvest is frozen fish. Um, so a lot, of, and we need, we need extra money for the, for the food for one. And then just the maintenance and, um, I'm getting ready to have to buy another freezer because we had another one go down that actually couldn't be fixed. So, and those are three to four thousand dollars a piece. Um, I don't know. I just um, I feel like it's just the need is growing in our community, and it's really sad to see um, families that are just you know digging into a hot meal in their car before they get out of the parking lot with their hands. <coughs> If that doesn't break your heart, I don't know what will, because I don't know. I mean, I, I've never been that hungry that I would just like could have to go get a free meal and, and eat with my hands because I couldn't wait to get home. Um, I, I just can't imagine, you know, what these kids are going through and what these parents are having to, you know, these grandparents tell me, you know, I have to decide what if I want to do this or, or if I want to buy food. And so they either are so appreciative of what we do, but I wish we could do more. Um, we do give out food boxes twice a month. They are allowed to come every two weeks. Um, they are allowed to come every night that we're open, which is Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday from 6 to 7 for a hot meal. Um, some people will come and get the hot meal most nights. Um, some come just for the boxes and they say, no, we'll go home and eat our own food. So, you know, we're helping all types of people, all walks of life. Um, you know, I have people who tell me I've never had to do this before. You know, what do I do? I, I've never had to ask anybody for help. And um, we've just recently started giving out hygiene supplies because we have people who can't afford to buy the soap if they buy food or they buy, you know, pay, get, buy gas to get to work. They don't have the extra money to buy shampoo they need. So we've been trying to keep that on hand by to get people to donate it. Uh, we've had to buy a few things. Uh, um, and over the winter, you know, we, we give out blankets and coats because some of these people are living in houses with no electricity and no running water. Um, I try my best to give water out if I, if I have somebody I know that has no water. And so, you know, buying a lot of water is not cheap either. But, um, you know, we have a need in this community that I, I wish that everybody could see. Um, living in a home with no heat, no water, no electricity, you know, they're out of the weather. But how as a kid, you know, get up in the morning and get ready for school with no water, no electricity, and have to go to school hungry and pretend that they can focus on school and do schoolwork. You can't teach a child who's hungry or a child who's lived in poverty that can't even get the necessities met in their home. So that's all we want to do is we just want to help these people. Uh, I, you know, we went as far as like having somebody's electricity turned back on or water turned back on, but we don't get a lot of money. So that's, you know, we, we have to be real careful with that and make sure that we vet the people and make sure it's, you know, legitimate. I never give them the money. I always come and pay for it myself. Um, but that's just the overview of what we do. Um, very near and dear to my heart. All the money that we get in loaves and fishes stays in loaves and fishes. Um, if you have any questions, I'd, I'd love to answer them. I'd love to see y'all come by and just visit us sometime. I've asked a lot of our uh, people that are running for office to come by and uh, see what we do, just to see what goes on there, because there's so many people tell me they don't know, you know, where we are, what we do. And um, so I haven't seen a lot of those people, but I've had a few come by and their eyes were kind of open to what they saw here. Um, 
and I invite you guys to come anytime. We, you know, we we start serving at six o'clock and we try to wrap it up by seven. And you know, in, in the hours time, we serve two hundred to two hundred fifty meals a night. Um, we give out anywhere from twenty to. Uh, I guess last night we gave forty-one boxes out. So. Um, and that's four nights a week. So, you know, we have some other places in the county that people say, you know, or this need to give out food. They give it out once a month. Um, and it's on a certain time, a certain day that people can't always make it. So we've tried to make it convenient that people can get there. Uh, have people would come on bicycles and strap it all over their bicycles to get back to get back home. I have a man who walks with a little bitty basket and he's made wheels and put on it and he stuffs all he can in there and then he puts the rest in his pockets and his coat and, and he takes all that and walks back <coughs> home for his family. I had a kid who was 13 came on his scooter one night to get a food box for his family because his mom he didn't know where his mom was and his brothers and sisters needed food. So these are the kind of things we're seeing and all we want is just your support. Any questions? What uh, charity tracker do you use? Uh, right now we're using the Food Pantry Helper. And uh, we have another one with Second Harvest that they're supposed to, we're supposed to like get with them and do the training on. And I'm not sure exactly what the name of that is. But I have it in my, um, on the Food Pantry Helper. I, um, the dates are there so, you know, they can't take advantage and get it early. But the meals they can get every night, there's no requirement for that. No questions? Thank you guys, and I really appreciate your support so far, and I look forward to your support in the future. I invite you to come see us. All right, let's uh, do Appalachian Hills Rescue. This is Bono. Bono's one of our more recent rescues. And he's happy now. He, he came along to let you know what we do with Appalachian Hills. So, Appalachian Hills, we're here to request $12,000 for the year 2022. This amount will allow us to continue serving or saving animals in need in Burke County. The money donated will help the expense of caring for the daily news. And the veterinary costs with proper medical care for these animals. That includes spay neuter, vaccinations, and medical emergencies for the animals in our care. We will use the money, the county's money appropriation, to help cover the expenses with great care. This will ensure that the animals of Appalachian <coughs> are Last year we found homes for 248 animals. Already this year we found homes for 112. And about 328, 22, we have adopted a total of 1,288 animals that will come. We look forward to this morning County to help continue with our mission to save the homeless animals. In your packet, you'll find a summary of receipts and expenditures, and there's also a PowerPoint presentation. And I thank you. Uno thanks you, and Appalachian <coughs> thank you. Is there any questions? Yeah. We have fosters. We have uh, volunteers that foster these homes, these animals in their homes. Uh, we set up a tractor supply on Saturdays and have a function event on Saturday. We do not charge an adoption fee. We have free donations. No questions. Point out that none of us are paid, including myself. I got paid. I adopted this little guy. <laughs> 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 got more people up here trying to adopt him, so you better run with him. <laughs> <laughs> There's not enough money in this room to get a job. We did start out as a foster, but I have three rescue dogs. <laughs> I wouldn't sell any of them. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you so much. All right, thank you. All right, uh, next up, the Park Tennessee Development District. Yeah, there should be like three sheets stuck in the front of the two three go. I'm Susan Reed. I'm with First Tennessee Development District. Um, Carter County has been uh, part of our organization for 56 years. Um, we serve the eight counties in Northeast Tennessee. Mayor Woodby is a member of our <coughs> directors and our executive committee. Um, we provide a lot of services. Um, one of the things I, I'm sure you'll be most interested in are some of the grants that, that we uh, are able to secure on behalf of Carter County and, and Elizabeth. Uh, this past year, we were able to help get uh, $1.391 million uh, for the covered bridge and for TCAT to get equipment. Um, we provide services for the elderly. Um, we we finance the fund the meals, the congregate home delivered meals, home after services, personal care for low income and elderly. We are court appointed guardians for low income elderly that don't have a family to look after them and provide um, decision making for their um, finances and health care. Um, some of the other things that we are involved in are things that help provide our housing. Uh, we do um, housing rehabilitation and sometimes uh, reconstruction. Um, we offer services in the area of uh, workforce, um, grant writing, grant administration. Uh, we are asking for just a little bit less money this year than we asked for last year. Uh, it's based on the population. Our request last year was for $13,262. This year we're asking for $13,015. Happy to answer any questions anybody might have. Um, our, our local, what we call our local groups, and that's the local government contribution small part of our budget, but it does leverage a lot of, of other money that, that state and federal money that we're able to get to provide services for. Questions? Thank you. Uh, it's 7.55, so everybody, um, unless there's somebody that has a thought, you have to go here and take a short period. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm the Elizabeth. We'll take a few minute break. We'll be back at 805. Uh, so everybody will come back in then. We'll be back starting.
Chairman, committee members, thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here to present tonight. Uh, I'm going to take a little different approach than I've taken in the past, and I'm sure you all will appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, this year's request, uh, last year we received 15000 I'm asking for food, but honestly, uh, anything that Carver County would be willing to invest into this program, I would appreciate, and I think it would go a long way. And uh, this year's request is focused on making an impact that affects immediate ROI to the commission, the county, and also, too, really focuses on the strength that Carver County holds tied to the quality of life and community attractions. To me, I think that's probably one of the most important things. Uh, I know a lot of people associate economic development with industrial recruitment. I got to tell you, though, when, when you're trying to sell a house and you don't have a house to sell, it's hard to do. Um, the fact that there's not a lot of available land, no inventory here, it makes that job extremely hard. So a lot of time and effort's really gone in. We'll think about some creative ways that we can ultimately look to bring value and uh, return on investment and ultimately revenue back to the community. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the remote working program that we launched in June of 2021 in Johnson City, Tennessee, was the pilot program. And I quickly pulled up uh, in June, really dating all the way to the day, and we'll continue to go on. We asked uh, the city of Johnson City to fund $300,000 to go to this program. And with that, we strictly focused on recruiting individuals that had the ability to remote work. We saw a major increase, obviously, through the pandemic that more and more people transitioned to remote work. Quite honestly, I think you're going to continue to see it even as we get past the pandemic. But all the way up until uh, 2025, about 32.6 million Americans are expected to be working remotely full time. And so when we created the program, we really wanted to look at what's the value of a job, what a salary has tied to economic impact. And when we went to the city of Johnson City, we basically said, we can recruit individuals that make fifty thousand dollars and they move here the economic impact is going to be right about eighty five hundred dollars and so we created this program uh, looking at the opportunity to actually incentivize individuals to move to the community that had the ability to remote work we partnered up with agencies like track bike lpi a few others that even offered incentives not tied to the monetary side of things but also giving them discounts and buying mountain bikes spas grills kayaks with the whole intent to really get out and explore about what makes this place special tied to the outdoors. And that's really the emphasis on the kayaks and the bikes and the grills. And then with that too, I'll quickly kind of just show you a marketing video that we used and talk about how we actually pushed this out. Apparently I won't show you a marketing video. Well, I had to pause the video. Regardless of it, you get the gist of it, uh, really focusing on the outdoor side, working where the quality of life is amazing and not being the hustle bustle of the New York City, of Chicago, and Nashville, Atlanta, you name it. And uh, I wanted to give you what you see in front of you, really focus on a quick executive summary. As you look through it, it's from June of 2021, we've uh, had 135 eligible applicants actually apply for the program. We've uh, accepted 21. We've been pretty stringent on what we've been uh looking at in terms of the type of applicant because we only had a limited pool of money. We focused a lot of money really tied towards marketing, looking at streaming media across several markets like Nashville, Dallas, Chicago, San Jose, other areas. And then two, really looking at uh, social media target ads like on LinkedIn. Uh, with those 21, the potential economic impact of those individuals is right about $375,000 annually. 
and that's the community. And we really categorize that and say if you make it, you make a, uh, if you make a certain salary, that translates to supporting small business, buying groceries, gas, you name it, anything that ultimately translates into revenue coming back into the economy directly to the government. <clears throat> Just quickly touching on that, we reached about a million people at our targeted marketing reach. We really looked at uh, top industries, but we saw a lot of folks coming in in finance, IT, professional services, technical services, healthcare. Uh, this to me was probably the most um, you know, mind boggling thing that I, that I saw throughout this whole program that I think really brings a lot of value. We've actually accepted people into the program that work for United Healthcare, Citigroup, United Airlines, Disney, Apple, Blue Cross Blue Shields. Universal Studio, Price Waterhouse, House Coopers, PayPal, and Mars Inc., which is the parent company for M&M's, Kit Kats, Pete's Coffee, Neutral Max Dog. So individuals that really, um, <coughs> you don't think about recruiting a Disney, but we actually have people that work at Disney that live right here in this region. And that shows the dynamic that remote work really is going to have. Um, I talk about this request uh, really much different than what we've done in the past. What I'd like to bring forward for y'all to consider and why we put the $40,000 in there is we're also asking Elizabeth for $35,000 so we can actually have $75,000 go directly to the program. $75,000 of that would not go directly to a salary, would not go directly to any services that NREF is going to be doing in house. It will go directly to individuals that choose to locate in Carter County or Elizabeth. And to me, I think that's the most important thing at all. I want you to feel the direct benefit of it. To me, I think it's the best opportunity Carter County has to actually realize true success in terms of job creation. Here. Uh, when you look at some of the factors tied to workforce, there's more births, I mean, more deaths than births, and that's just about in every single county in Northeast Tennessee. When you really look at population decline, workforce shortages, you really got to look at ways to impact the economy. And to me, when individuals are choosing a place to live or ultimately a company they want to work for, quality of life being the biggest component and where they're ultimately going to go. You're going to see this major shift continue to happen regardless whether COVID is here or not. People have experienced remote work and it's a thing that's here to stay and it's only going to grow. So I want to make sure our region's ahead of that and there's an opportunity here that you can actually realize success. I know you may have questions about the program in more detail. Eligibility, I think that's probably a really important thing. you got to relocate to the area within six months of acceptance. Uh, you have to be a full-time remote worker. We have policies in place where basically we get you name the company, Disney, Apple, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, they have to verify you work for them. They have to verify your salary and they have to verify you actually how long you've been employed there. You have to be at least 24, uh, 24 years old. And we also do background searches when we the applicants as well. Minimum, minimum income of $50,000. Probably the biggest thing that I've seen, and I'm not kidding you, the average income of the applicants we've accepted is $98,000. That's huge. That's something that I can't do in terms of when we recruit an industry to come here and set up shop. A lot of those jobs are averaging about $30,000 a year. When you think about the impact that comes directly back into the government from that standpoint, it's not property tax driven. It doesn't even come close to what this program can actually uh, bring forward. You know, looking at the $40,000, if you include the 75 total, that includes Elizabeth and so uh, you know, into that, we anticipate we'll probably get about 20 to 25 remote. And to me, I think you really look at the economic impact, probably right in line with the 21 we've already accepted of about $374,000. Any you may have any questions about the request, and I'm happy to send out additional information if needed. Mitch, I know you've got, I mean, the majority of your funding right there, for, I guess for probably this program, is City of John City, Washington County, and Jonesboro. Taking 75 of Carter counties with Elizabeth, and how will you promote this program for, for people to move to Carter County or Elizabeth? Oh, without a doubt. Well, the way I really look at it, Ross, um, the Johnson City Metro is one when you're really on the outside looking at it. Having that name, that identity, I think you're going to have to still stick to that Johnson City piece and talk about the metro and the amenities. A lot of that is hopefully not tied to the outdoors. I think the piece that we'll do differently is that people have the option that if you and choose to look at the housing stock in Carter County and you find a house there, you're eligible for the program. And the promotion comes right along with that. Right now, we opened it up really with this last year at Johnson City in Washington County. We want to grow this, quite honestly. I think this is a nice trend. Of, this is a nice uh, opportunity to really come into a community like Carter County that offers a lot of value. And I hope it really allows us to even think about Unicoi County, Hawkins County, Sullivan County in the future. We see success here. 
I think we will uh, since June again, 135 eligible applicants. Apply. You said you had one million reached. What was the funding that was used to for the one million? What was the total amount of funding for that? We've got uh, what we've done on a quarterly basis is go to the city of Johnson City. We've actually talked about the campaign and what we've been able to do. The impressions, the reach, the engagement, uh, links, click through the city. Where we're actually doing that and markets that we're actually doing it as well. Um, from a marketing standpoint, we find the slide. You know, uh, as I'm doing that, just to give you an example, like in Chicago too, with streaming media, we actually had that commercial that I tried to play show up on Fox Sports, CNN, ESPN app, and MSNBC. Yeah, that's it. So here's an example like in phase three, uh, and I'll get that exact number. I'm sorry, I don't have this right now. But phase three, which was kind of the third phase of our marketing pitch, we looked at about $2,800 spent on LinkedIn. Uh, impressions you can kind of see that we've been able to get on there on that side. When we talk about, uh, you know, we've got the streaming media on here too. The CTV, the streaming media was about $12,156. Obviously, when you run a commercial, that's going to cost some money. But we're at least able to actually market into certain communities that we thought we'd have a great reach to. I know from a reach standpoint as well, we chose, uh, we spent a lot of time in Chicago, Nashville, Dallas. Nashville, obviously, uh, Tennessee, a lot of people are looking at yeah, Nashville right now. A lot of people are moving in, but a lot of people are, are experiencing their own things in Nashville and want to get out. It's an easy market for the reach. One of them very familiar with the area already. Chicago and Dallas specifically, uh, high concentration in finance IT. Uh, that's where we're seeing probably the biggest thing for a bucket individual actually looking here that have the ability. I'll get you a direct total spend for the entire thing, though, because that's what we set up the marketing side. I go back to say this, though um, the marketing piece, it's allowed us to get some accolades. We're actually recognized through LinkedIn, Ads of the World, CNBC, and Graphics Skull. We actually won an award through that. We're going to be Actually, uh, we're actually going to be uh, submitting the program on behalf of the International Economic Development Council as well, for consideration for an award as well. But I do think it's one that you're starting to see some communities tap into. We just wanted to get ahead of the game. And again, I'll reiterate it. I'll put it in a statement. Every dollar that Carver County would give to this, I guarantee we'll go to an individual that goes to Carver County, most Carver County. And that's how much I believe in the program. I don't want to bring value to this community because I believe it's a All right, thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shelly Perham, and I am the new CEO at the Boys and Girls Club of Elizabethton. I want to thank you for having me here. Um, I'm not new to the club, but I am new to the CEO role. Um, so let me also thank the county for supporting the club over the years. Um, I know I didn't hand out anything fancy, and I have most of this stuff in my packet, but I, what I've become acutely aware of is that a lot of folks in our area don't really know what we do inside the club. Um, and so I just handed out some photos of, of kind of the last the last year. Um, we are in 2022. Um, I mean, I'm very proud to say we're celebrating our 75th anniversary. So the Boys and Girls Club, and in part thanks to the county, um, have been serving 
Carter County since 1947. So I'm very proud of that. I want to recap 2021 just a little bit because it was still a very unconventional year. And I won't take a lot of your time, I promise. I know it's late. Um, but our schools were still in a hybrid model. And while the schools were in the hybrid model, the club was open um, 11 and a half hours a day. So we opened and served a breakfast and we did remote learning. Um, we were able to serve snack and dinner and allow all of our families to go to work um, to support their families and also for our kids to come in and um, do their school work. And we were there to provide them with tutors. Our, I have an education coordinator. Um, schools who were in school, we would also pick up and transport them after school, which was very unconventional for us um, to just do partial schools. And then um, we did open a second club in 2021 in the Stony, in the Stony Creek area. Um, as we were still uh, working under the CDC guidelines and only being able to serve so many under social distancing guidelines as well, we wanted to serve more people and we wanted to serve that area. And so we did open a second club in the, in the Stony Creek um, area. Um, we, our, our, your funding um, assisted us in, in handling the addition labor cost to the two sites, as well as transportation and everything that goes along with the supplies. Um, your funding goes directly to our programming and to the members and the families that we serve. We're on track this year to serve over 425 youth. Um, this is more on track with normal year. Um, our summer program opened and it will open again this year in regular fashion. Um, we, uh, we transport from nine different county schools. Uh, we have a fleet of three buses that we own. And so the maintenance and the care of those buses is very important to us being able to pick up from all of the schools that we do transport from every day after school. In the summer, we'll use those buses for field trips and for other educational purposes. Um, focus in this next year is on our teen program. It has doubled. I don't know if that is anything to do with the pandemic, but post pandemic, our teen program, our, our ADA has doubled. Um, we're approximately 17 to 20 teens every day. So we're expanding that designated space this year so that we can serve more teens. I love that we're a safe place for them to come after school, uh, keeps them off of our streets. And also we're providing them with um, uh, programming inside. Um, we do a job development program. Last year we hired four of our teens to work inside the club, which is a really great program because it allows us to give them some of those work ethic skills and those job skills without them uh, allowing them to maintain employment as well. Um, we are doing, the teens do a, um, this is one of the photos that you have there, but they do a say no to substance campaign, um, inside the club and outside the club. And they're fanatic about, um, encouraging all young people to say no to substances. And so they, they find a lot of creative and fun ways to, um, to promote that. And I think it's very important in our community. We also have a specific program that's designated to life skills for our teens. So we want them to only, not only have job readiness, but we want them to know how to budget and manage money. Um, we want to give them good social skills so when they're out in the area, we do a diplomas to degrees program with them, which is basically academic related for them to see that they can not only just go on to college, but that there are other programs, whether it's an apprenticeship or it's a, a community college or it is a certification program. We want them to think beyond high school in whatever capacity suits them best. Um, our academics is a focus. It always has been and it will continue to be. Every day we provide after school care, I have an education coordinator. We have, we partnered with the Tennessee Tutoring Corps this year. So the tutors come in and they help our, our young people with homework. The learning loss that we saw during the pandemic was incredible. Um, and the reading loss specifically was very um, striking to me. Um, we have an intense reading program that we provided last year. We'll also provide that this year. 92% of the participants who were in that reading program assessed at, um, below reading level when they started. 92% of them increased or at or above reading level when they ended the summer. 
Um, we also offer a brain gains program in the summer. Our brain gains program is all about retention. So whatever you learned at the end of this school year, we want you to retain that knowledge when you begin the next school year. So our brain gains program is a really fun way for different age groups, different grade levels to retain what they've learned in the, in the current school year. Um, this year, we um, were able to purchase a remote tech lab. Um, what this is basically is two charging stations. We have what, 65 different Chromebooks and they charge all the time. We have opening our doors to our members, parents and families so that they can do tax night. They can come in and do their taxes. They can use our Wi-Fi, our broadband, as well as our devices. Um, and we also am opening it to um, job seeking um, and anything else if they need to make a medical appointment or whatever they may need to do, but they don't have the broadband or the internet access that we do or the devices. Um, we found as a remote learning site, a lot of our families were sharing devices or they didn't have any. So coming into the club and being able to use our devices in our remote lab has been um, very helpful, I think, to our families. We served over 24,000, we serve over 24,000 meals a year. So every day um, we serve snack and dinner. In the summer we serve breakfast, lunch, and snack. Um, so we, we wanna make sure, and, and our food is prepared on site. So dinner is a hot meal. It's a hot meal where our two chefs are, are chopping up lettuce, um, they're boiling noodles, they're cooking, you know, um, in meat. I mean, it's it's a meat, vegetable, um, grain, and dairy in every meal. Um, so I'm, I'm very proud of our food program as well. Um, we are an open serve site, so anyone who does need food or needs a meal, um, we will provide that for them. They can just come into our door. They don't have to be a member. Um, we're open uh, those 11 and a half hours on all snow days holidays, planning days, so when parents, our families can still go to work, do what they need to do, and, and we'll take care of their kids on those days that they weren't expecting to have to take off. Um, we do all of that for $10 per child per week. So for $10 a week, a child comes to our facility um, and receives after school care, enrichment programming, we do STEAM, so we have the arts, we have the sciences, we have social you know, recreation, we have two full gyms, that we utilize and we also um, provide um, and work with Parks and Rec, but we do provide our own community sports programs, um, sports athletic or community athletics. This year we added soccer and flag football. Um, so I'm, I'm, I believe in athletics are very healthy for kids um, and their growth and their development for all kinds of reasons, um, specifically their social skills. Um, so we do all that for $10 a week. Your you supporting the club allows us to keep our fees low. Um, in the summer, it's $35 a week. And let me just add that we'll never turn a child away because they don't have the means to pay. Um, those are just our fees. And the support from the county allows us to provide these services at that low, low cost. Any questions for me? Terrific. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll have ARM. My name is Scott Reynolds. I am a member of the Board of Directors of ARM, Assistance and Resource Ministry. We're in our 31st year here in the county. For those who don't know, in 1991, the, the Carter County Ministerial Association said, we're getting embarded, embarred, uh, embarded on by people coming to our churches and getting help and help and help and help and help. We feel like we're not doing this equitably. And guess what? This organization came into being uh, so that we could distribute the resources that the county uh, churches had or uh, the county is a, uh, in any way could make that fair. Um, we come to you asking for the same funding that we asked for last year at $7,500. We want to also thank you for the additional monies that were provided to allow us, if you've seen the, the article in the recent paper, we got a larger cooler that allows us to store fresh vegetables 
to be able to put into the food uh, uh, carts that we give out throughout the month. And that has just been a life saver. A life saver. You allowed us to make that happen. And we appreciate it beyond measure. Changed the whole face for us as an organization. So you made a tremendous difference. We're still only operating on Tuesdays and Wednesdays right now because we lost our elderly volunteer base during the pandemic. We lost them because they were not allowed to be a part of the out and about. We had to protect them. So some of us younger ones, yeah, like me, but some of ours were in their 90s and were still volunteering. So we can see the difference in the perspective. We're hoping to, to get back to Thursdays, so we be open three days a week, as soon as our volunteer base increases. Um, for example, in February, we served uh, 433 families with food, and we that equates to 916 individuals, and uh, it's incredible. We're still getting new households, and our numbers are increasing constantly because the additional money on the map cards is going away and we need us to help supply the food they need for their families. Lest I let you forget, uh, Second Harvest Food Bank has researched that and there's 13% of all the Upper East Tennessee counties have food insufficiency, food insecurity. That means in Carter County, we're talking six to 7,000 people who go hungry every night without these additional assistances. So it is, to me, a wonderful method by which we're able to help our community uh, in every way. If, if there's any other question that you all have for me, I would love to hear it. Yeah. One question, I just want to, so you guys are going to open two days a week and you're still serving over 400 families a month? That is correct. There are days that are lined out to the street. All right, thank you. Thank you all. Next up, we have the Elizabeth Senior Center. Oh, I have one more question, Austin. What was the name of the... Uh, charity checker that y'all use? We use uh, Oasis Insight. And that is supplied through Second Harvest Food Bank. Mm -hmm. Just dangerous. My name is Brittany. I um, am the new director of the Elizabeth Center. Our newsletters that we mail out to our members. So, as you most of you know, the Elizabethan Senior Center has been around for over 50 years. It actually started in a house on the current property in 1976, and it developed into a full blown center in 1981. Um, and Miss Kathy, I think, was the director for over 30 years. Um, the center services both Carter County and Elizabethan. Um, we, last year, we had a bit of a, a slower year. Um, we served 398 members. Um, we have over 500 members, but um, the pandemic kind of affected us. Um, so we are, on average, seeing 45 to 50 people a day coming into our center. Um, Pre-pandemic, that was about 75 to 80 people. Um, 58 percent of our members are actually Carter County residents, and 42 of those are Elizabethan city residents. 
um, at the center, and you guys are more than welcome to come. I'd take you on a tour. Um, you can sign up when you're 55. Um, membership for 55 um, to 60 is $30, and 60 and above is 15 a year. Um, to me, our mission um, at the center, we provide a lot of activities and programs. Um, one of the things that we do that I'm really proud of is we partner with the yoga firm to provide two certified yoga instructors twice a week. Um, we have a line dancing instructor, um, and she's really picking up on her members participating. We do aerobics. Um, I've just started being yoga back every um, Friday, and that's a very hot um, event. <laughs> Um, and we, in any holiday, I like to do a theme bingo, but um, we also have a fitness room um, with a lot of fitness equipment and weights, um, and we have those regularly serviced. Um, our members love our fitness room, and we're seeing you know, close to 20 people in there every day. Um, our members also enjoy a billiards room, two desktop computers, a small library, and a large commons, commons area for daily lunch and events. Um, the center values um, Increase in awareness, preparedness, and connection to needed resources in the area. Um, I know Red Cross was up here. Um, she had somebody come out and they did a uh, safety course and they um, told everybody about their smoke detector program. Um, we had a Parkinson's disease class today. Um, and I partnered with, you know, we all we all partner with UT Extension Eagle Aid to offer classes on estate planning or nutrition. It's it's really anything the members are interested in and, and and they will tell me if they want something and it's my job to kind of you know hear something and find it and, and bring it into the center for them. Um, we also have um, we work with area on aging to provide evidence-based workshops and that can range from living with chronic conditions to diabetes education um, and we also Kathy Kathy did a um, support group for grandparents raising grandchildren that I would like to start back. Um, they had to quit because of COVID. Um, we also host the SALT Council, um, which is seniors in law enforcement working together. Um, and we're going to host a health fair um, from the fall, and we're also doing an elder abuse and parents bingo event in the of June. So um, also at the center, we partner with HRA um, for the Meals on Wheels. And I'm really proud of the meals because during the pandemic, and Kathy May, I told you last year, they never stopped coming in to serve the meals. They always came in to make sure the meals go out. Um, on average a week, Carter County sends out 590 meals a week. And 42 of those a day go to rural Carter County areas like Hampton, Stony Creek. Um, and right now we're having a lot of trouble keeping volunteers, kind of the same issue that Arm is having. Um, a lot of our volunteers, one of our volunteers is 96 years old. Um, yeah, he's dedicated. Um, but we really need volunteers for our meals because that makes the difference. You know, when people get meals, they often make two or three meals out of that one hot meal. So I want to see that our meals continue to go out and very important, especially to the rural areas where people have difficulty with transportation. Um, and the next thing is we partner with NetTrans. So if they become a member and they don't have transportation, um, NetTrans, um, we, we get funding from Perry on Aging to help with the NetTrans um, to pay for their tickets to and from the center. And we also help them go on outings like to Walmart, pre pandemic. We also did food city um, to help them kind of get out and socialize and get their groceries. A lot of people do their grocery shopping that way. Um, the Senior Center is a crucial element to our community. Um, it's one reason I took the job. Um, it's just I'm, I'm passionate about about seniors in the community, and I think when I saw the Senior Center, I didn't see a job. I just I, I saw my life's work, something I could do forever, and it didn't feel like work, and it doesn't. Um, and I really appreciate, I know you all have been a big part here, 23% of our funding, um, and we're asking, for the same amount of funding. Um, I know that last year and, and the year before that has been pretty hard economically, but um, we are a safe harbor for our center. We protect people from abuse or scams. We educate them. We help address issues like malnutrition, depression, 
um, those with financial need. Um, any of our staff are trained to help them out a live application or a SNAP application. Um, I've called APS several times myself on you know instances where I felt like I needed to, it needed to be addressed. Um, so all of the staff, and there's not many of us, um, we're going to work with every individual to make sure they're safe and their needs are being met. Right. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Yeah, it's good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm the yoga. All right, next up we'll have the Tennessee Rehabilitation Center. Yes. Good evening. Uh, I'm Alex Hamilton. I'm with the Tennessee Rehabilitation Center here in Elizabeth. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Carter County for their years of support. Uh, they also supported us for our program for, for years, even before my time with the uh, program. Um, for those of you, of you that don't know, uh, we help uh, individuals with uh, disabilities um, obtain employment and uh, get needed training they need to be successful in employment. This includes things like uh, safety training, soft skills training, uh, resume building, interview prep, uh, application assistance, job coaching. Um, we help uh, individuals study for learners per minutes, uh, CDLs. Um, we help them obtain IDs if, for, um, if a disability keeps them from driving. We help them obtain their IDs. Um, this might be either paying for the ID. Um, going and supporting them as they go to the DMV to obtain uh, obtain ID uh, just for you know just for needed support um, for their comfort. Um, we provide post secondary uh, training um, in this program. We uh, help them identify different ways that they can find funding to help pay for their education. Uh, we help them get to other schools, um, escort maybe on you know school tours that the schools provide. So that they have a familiar face that are with them. Um, we are currently working on a program now that we're loosely calling a supported training program. Um, so we hope to extend this out to several different uh, different areas of, uh, of work. Right now we're going to be focusing on CNA training. And what this means is we're going to be with our contacts with Ballot Health. We're going to partner with Ballot Health for CNA training, and our role in this would be to provide uh, studying and test prep um, for our customers. Um, coaching within the classes. Um, part of that partnership would be uh, that will allow us to attend the classes with our customer. Again, you notice know, provide maybe emotional support and for us to get a better idea of what they're what they're learning to help them study better. Uh, other parts of this might be you know helping them get them connected, paying for certain licenses, uh, things like that that they will need with this. Um, so uh, also help. Uh, be us connecting them with um, experienced workers within the medical field, the CNA field, um, to come and talk to them, answer questions. Um, and we also be providing needed materials. This may be uh, scrubs, uh, any kind of thing they might need for, for the CNA training for the, for the position. Um, we help provide uh, interview clothing. Um, we help uh, provide housing assistance. Transportation assistance, whether that be helping them get their permit or helping them uh, provide paying for their transportation through you know, a, a transportation service. Um, the funds that you all provide uh, help pay for these materials, um, they help pay for the, the staff that help uh, make all this uh, our work possible. Um, and we also, uh, our, our main goal is to help fund the independent. So these supports um, through us are temporary, um, <clears throat> but our, our ultimate goal is to make them more independent, help them find meaningful employment, and get all the education things that they need for to be successful. If, we, if they do need more sports, more long-term sports, things like that, uh, we have partners uh, with different different organizations that help provide more long-term service. Thank you. 
Next, uh, is there anybody here for the first Tennessee Human Resource? Uh, Harder County Soil Conservation. Thank y'all for having us tonight. I'm Mike Nifer, and I have with me Chris Williams. We're representing the Board of Supervisors of the Carter County Water and Soil Conservation District. Uh, we have been in Carter County for a long time, and we work with farmers, we work with landowners, and we have worked with the county on different projects that will help cut down on soil erosion and improve water, water quality in Carter County. Uh, we not only do these kind of projects, but we have had in-service trainings uh, on farm safety, uh, weed control, uh, different things that might be uh, used by the farmers to improve the soil quality in, in Park County. We've worked with the, the emergency rescue squad and fire departments to have training on, on, on farm safety, on farmers first aid, which was a basic course in what to do and what to expect if you were confronted with emergency. Uh, we're here tonight to ask for a, a budget request of $44,000. I think that's what we asked for last year. Uh, we don't ask for, for any additional money. Uh, we have had some improvements in our office. We, we got a new office that is located on Highway 91 in the strip mall there for Kimbrough's restaurant set. And it has been open for going on two years. We anticipate having an, an open house where we can invite y'all to come into our community. <coughs> uh, the COVID situation has kind of shut us down. We were at a reduced capacity because of the federal guidelines that we had to follow. Uh, other things that, that we do, we, we have several projects that are in the handout that, uh, that was given you the last page. Uh, we've got, we have two different pools of money that we draw from. One is a federal funded program called EQUIP. In that program, uh, we have a pro uh, projects that are going to be, uh, that are in, a lot of them are in process, but they need to be completed by 2024. Those projects total almost a million dollars, 900 some thousand dollars. We just recently uh, received approval on several other projects that will be added to this. They've not been signed by the property ownership. That's another $150,000. So we're looking at bringing into the community something over a million dollars in improvements that can be done. In addition to the money that we request from y'all, we we'll spend on our, uh, on our local employees. So it all be spent Carter County. Uh, we have already paid out over $100,000 on these projects. Uh, we have additional money that will be coming through the Tennessee Department of Agriculture that may be upwards of $100,000 when we complete what we are starting. So that, that's what we are. Uh, that's what we try to do. We work with landowners. We don't have to necessarily be working with farmers. We have worked with the county, as I said, on projects in, in the past and, and look forward to doing that in the future. That was a, kind of a quick way to go through it, but uh, does anybody have any questions? We'll try to answer. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you all for your support. Anybody here from the Chamber of Commerce? Uh, all right, uh, we're going to do the Carter County Emergency and Rescue Squad.
problem is to have the issues, money, keep it up. So I have asked Rescue is in there also. So, three, five, seven, forty-three. Last year, to four point one two five nine five. Every bit of the money that if we get the increase in this one salaries where. Be competitive. I might have thought we was there close, but some county and Johnson City is already up to the end, so we're low on code. There's too many employees. If we don't have your help, This paper here is what we are right now. The salaries. Way below. Our grade for the basic is $14.30. Full time EMTA is 1648 Full time maintenance is 49097 If you look at this copy right here, it's a four year plan. It shows the raises each year. We must reoccur this point. This is to provide three LS trucks, two BLS trucks, right now. The next budget is three LS trucks, two BLS. Paramedics, $25. AMT is $21. You can look through there. I don't have to have time to look at this. That's a four year plan. The key for certain rescue green keys and paramedics well around. I'm going to stat. But if I don't do something to get these individuals coming in and still leaving their service. We are putting this down in the gym. So, I'm <coughs> looking very hard at this. I'm not saying today, I was or anything like that. I'm just saying, looking out into the future, we're going to be in trouble because we're so far behind now. It's ridiculous. I give everything I can to the board. And Make the walk across the county line to make more money. They're leaving. It's a stressful job. We went from 24 hours a day to 12 hour shifts, trying to make it easy for them to go home. After a 12 hour shift, uh, they get in there at 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. You don't see these people again. Only when they come back, the other crew take over and go out again. And they're they're absolutely stressed out. And they work very hard to stay here. And it's getting harder to stay here because of the payment. Yeah, I'm gonna let Nancy talk to you a little bit about this. She's more into the collections and all this stuff. And we just to listen to these numbers that. 
We don't get paid. We get all the money that comes in. We don't. Um, my name is Nancy Gears, and I haven't really spoken to you all before, I don't think. Um, but today I'll talk about the, the ways that we get money in ourselves, our own reimbursement. Um, this page in your packet, it says um, July 1, 2020 through June 2021, fiscal year. And it's just this year, the actual numbers of, um, of our billing. Um, the total charges that we filled out. For seven million seven hundred sixty-eight thousand one hundred dollars and ten cents. Um, of that money we billed out, um, we had to write off three million fifty-seven thousand six hundred ninety-eight and eighty-eight cents um, for insurance write-offs. Just write off the bat, Medicare and Medicaid um, money we have to write off that we cannot get from the patient. Um, then the next number is the bad debt write-offs, and it's over a million. This is um, money that we actually build out to patients, but they did not pay um, money for rescues for citizens of Florida County when they're out on the trail or um, have some sort of incident out in the lake, things that require a rescue team. If you remember, if you're a citizen of Carter County, they don't get a bill for that. It's provided for free. Um, and so because, this... Because the commission asked that to be done. If you live in Carter County, you cannot collect all these missions. The only thing we collect from is outside people. You know, if they come from Washington County or a lot of hikers are starting to get ready to start to walk the Appalachian Trail again. They have them in Minnesota, whatever. Plane crash, we have a lot of money on this. And we've got a lawsuit, it's been more than two years, two and a half years. And we had to go after him because he's not from this area and he has not paid. So it's in the court system. But the group of Carter County doesn't cost you a dime to be rescued in this county. Or the board of three quite Those write-offs also cover um, body transports, we take them over to Quillen for an autopsy. Um, transports of patients from the jail, things like that. And then there's a small number, 11,893.45 that um, we had to pay back that year to the insurance. Either they overpaid or they paid with this primary when they should have. Um, so that's not a large number, but it, it figures in. And then down at the bottom, that's a list of the money that we get from each of those insurance categories. Um, and I won't go through the numbers because you have them, but there's the Medicare A and B on the top. And then um, the Medicare HMO, that, that has really become um, what many of the people in our county have now. And the co-pays are actually a lot higher for the people out of their own pocket, almost $300 now. Um, so they're paying more to get this insurance, and then it leaves them a larger co-pay out of their pocket. And they're, you know, as we've heard from the other services, they're trying to decide if they're going to pay their electric bill or buy food or get their medicine. So we're sort of low on that. Because we don't turn anybody down. If they owe us money, we don't get there and say, oh, wait, we're not taking you because you owe us a bill. It's but, not it, like that. but it will go to the collections. Consider it in the And you can see here in a minute what we get out of the collections. Yeah, toward the bottom of that same page, um, the number of trips we sent for that year to collections. And this is after we try we try everything we can to take, you know, to get people to make even just small payments. And we ask for at least 50, but if they're sending $10 a month, we generally don't turn them over for that because that's what they, you know, they're trying at least. Um, so this particular year, we sent 846,792 cents to collections. And then at the bottom is what we actually got net back from that after we paid the fees, it was 24,000. So we send them a lot, we don't actually get a lot back from it. And this next page that I'm going to look, go through briefly is the collections activity, basically. And that has, um, for each month of that fiscal year, how much we sent to collections. Um, the front page is actually the payments that we received from of that packet by each month. And so you can see at the bottom the totals, the current fiscal year totals received. 
they took in a total of 46,000 and some and ended up, we got the 24,000. That's what they paid us for that whole fiscal year. The next page of that um, shows how much we sent to them. And so, um, and you, you can look at the all time numbers too. All time total, we've sent them 15,444 calls um, for an amount. We've sent them an amount all total of over $6 million. And on the previous page, the amount of all time that we've gotten from them since 2015 is 158,000. So we make, I mean, that's 158,000 over those seven years that we wouldn't have had, um, but it's it's not a great number. So from our 7,768,000 we built out, we ended up with, um, you know, not even half that, much, much less than half of that. We have a lot of people in this county that can't afford it, and I understand that. And we have never ever pushed anybody. We still get ten dollars, five dollars, and I've allowed it. I've, I've told the collection agent they could not afford fifty dollars. Try to make it easy, but when you spread that out over time, you know, we may pick them up eight or nine more times in their life, or whatever, and they never do. So. Basically, you're paying for somebody to sit there and make these emergency calls, and you hope you get paid. And you go pay your electric bill, you don't pay it. Guess what? They come and cut it off, didn't cost you a fortune to put it back on. But you didn't have money to pay the bill. You know, I ain't got money to pay the fine and everything else. But I've tried to keep that in this county. All I want to do is survive, make it even at every year. But out of this, out of this budget year right now, I think I'm going to budget five to four. Three to six times. And you're talking major money that builds up at the end of the year. Because I don't have a tax base. I, I go start all over. I estimate that we're not making this many calls. We don't make them. We don't get the money. But here I am trying to scramble to make it work. So, guys, it's very important that you look at this very hard. Forty years of the service, 29 as director, I can tell you right now, it will fall if you ain't careful. Now, there'll be people come in here, they ain't going to do what. I've worked for those people. They come in, they just take the transports, and they don't take nothing else, they don't do nothing. Lose your rescue, that hole in the yard. I mean, I've got 24 volunteers that I keep up and keep highly trained as we can. And not counting my medics, we got to go to college to get here. It ain't like it was four years ago when I got in. You went to a first aid class and then you went to an EMT class, it was maybe 40 years. Tennessee, across Tennessee, everybody is down with employees. It's just like an example of a lady who got charged and convicted for giving her own medication. It has already hurt the nurses across the state of Tennessee. With all the pressure that we had to go through, with all the COVID and all that transport, extra funding and everything going on, which I'm not saying jury of that. Hopefully that'll get returned somehow for her. But it's no different than our guys. We don't have a doctor in the back room. We have protocol. That doctor sets up, we follow those protocols to the team. And it's bringing the ER to our community. That's how advanced we are. Uh, so, I want you to really think about it. I wish you'd come up and visit me before you really make your decision and look at this stuff. If you don't want to get that, then that's fine with me. Somebody's going to pay them later. You've got to get all the way out there. 
I used to be scared to death to come up here before the commission and budget or anything else. It don't bother me. Because I know what's going to happen if I can't convince you that this is going to happen. It's happening today, right now in our community. You might not get an ambulance. That's a possibility. Years ago, I never dreamed of all the trucks that we've got that I would have a shortage, a staffing shortage. But now I've got all these trucks and nobody in because they're leaving this community going somewhere else. I put back over three million dollars back in our community. One way or the other, I buy trucks, them going to grocery store, they're paying their bills and everything. Else. So I don't think we're getting very close. I'm not correct or anything like that. I'm just telling you what's going to happen. And I hope I'm wrong at the end of the day. This is just to give them. I have to think of different things. I can't tell you how am I going to handle these people to stay, but we do a lot of work trying to get them to stay. And at the end of the day, you got to be your family just like everybody else. That's all I have. Yeah, we, we've got it here too. This is the end. Two hundred forty-one thousand dollars. This is a special ambulance that we were all obese patients in. This cop, you know, a cop owes. Commissioner asked me what it costs about thousand dollars. Thirty-five thousand dollars for that little cop that you're pushing around. Thirty-five thousand because it's got that medical back. You know, it's got everything you've got to do, and that's what the prices are. But this will help our, our people load these obese patients into back the animals. Trade it for 600 pounds. And so I inform the mayor and some of the health and welfare this is coming out of a different money. All this is coming out of here off you know, this budget. A, uh, this is all for the public. You know, ARP money. ARP. What was the total again? Because the letter says 420000 This sheet says yes. 30. What's what I said? You're going to have to forget that. What, what was that number again? It's right there in front of you on your uh, you budget. Right here. You do that. I've got a couple of copies. Okay, right there. If you want to. <coughs> Yeah, that's the other that's the other copy. That's the right here is what I gave that before you know John. Every bit of time. That's why I said forget about the other. I hate to do that to you all. But never too late. Sorry, just a request. I'm sorry, I can't hear. I'm sorry. I can't hear what the actual request was. Did you get your copy? 430? Is that what? No, he said 600. Oh, that's the other. Here's the difference. You say 4125000 It was a packet all together. I handed you the packet out, too. And you can probably answer this as well. Per our conversation, I know that you guys have been having that's the end, which is what I had. It's the actual request now. Has that been alleviated? Yes, we came up with, um, well, actually, we didn't. It came from Ballot yeah. themselves. We had a, I'm sorry, the, law, the county of Law is 601 574 AD. Plus the county for the county of Law Cases for the Rescue for the Why have it on there, the total amount rescue? Uh, no, but it's the 170 plus the guys yeah, right here. 771,574.80. Okay. Uh, 
the other creatures all just So the rescue stayed the same, just the rescue stayed the same. And this is going to get much And you know, I have to say, a lot of several of our people that have highly trained in rescue, I have to pay them too. Uh, that I have managers making sure everything's done. We just talked the other day about the gentleman that walked around. Got himself in the road, went over the falls. That was his last time he ever been over there. We can have trained professionals there to research and make sure that they're talking knots and everything else is tied correctly. And he lost his life. That's why I pay money to the people that are highly skilled in it, that does their does their job out here. And I went through many, many disasters in this county. Snow to floods to street line winds, everything good. And I've done it on what I had in the budget. It's all up. That's where we're at. I'll ask any kind of thing. What you got? I did. You know, our conversation about how the extended stays that you guys were having to stay at the hospital. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to know. Okay. I mean, I, I'm not in. I'm not in favor of helping Ballard a whole lot. Yeah. Well, <laughs> they're making money hand over fist. It has slowed down a lot because what we've done, we sent a memo to Ballard Hill. We're about 15 minutes. It, it was green, red. Yeah, here's how it goes. Um, if if it's if our status is green, which means we have more than one ambulance available in the county, okay. then we'll sort of wait. As long as we need to, I mean, hopefully not more than 30 minutes or 45 minutes, but we'll give them some time as long as there's other ambulances available. When we get down to one ambulance, um, that's sort of our yellow status. And that means there's one more ambulance available. And so they can stay 30 minutes if it's in that situation because there's another ambulance available. But as soon as that other one went out or they're down to no ambulances available, it goes to red. And red will we immediately leave. drop them. But now we do do a good transfer here. We have a form we fill out that we take to the charge nurse if we can find her or him or her. They held us hostage. Yeah. Well, that, we that's what we talked about yeah. was you having to stay four hours while they try sure. to find we, a place We've to stayed do. four hours. We've stayed five hours, six hours before. So yeah. that's not happening now? No, no. It's certainly improved. When you get 30 minutes, we're out of that door. And if it's if it's 15 minutes, there's no truck available, we're leaving. We're going out of that door. The answer to that call. They help everybody all across this nation. Hospitals will be amazing for staffing. The nurses was absolutely covered up, but that doesn't give them the right to hold hold us. At one time, there was a lawsuit going on about that. Those counties that was county owned, they started requesting the money from the nation, you know, to be there. That's fair. And uh, you so have to stay that long the grass slowed down. The grass will be with us. To, to it'll be like the common flu. It's going to be there every year. There's more mutation all the time with the disease. Uh, but it has slowed down. Uh, I can say in my service, the money we spent about sixty thousand dollars in chemicals and everything else to protect our people. I don't know of one that con got the, uh, the uh, COVID from a patient. It all came from their kids from school. They were up, or they went out to eat or whatever they did. They was protected if they done what we said and they did. So it put a lot of stress on us, a lot of stress. That's where we're at, Jim. I really wish you'd come up or have another. To meet with each and one of you to let you know what's going on. We vote the way the future will be. I know you've got so much money, I understand. Are there any other questions for me? So, the schedule that you included in here is uh, a pay increase is, to $4, $4 an hour, $5 an hour. 
six dollars an hour, seven dollars an hour increase. Right here, you start. This is what we're on now. Um, this right here is the biggest one. The first one next year is the biggest cost of 25, 21, 70. Each year is a dollar. Right. Okay, so over the next four or five years, what's the total increase that you're going to be looking for? Because well, this year you're looking for 601 and change, yeah. and then next year it would go to seven and change. Yeah. Well, that's right. 300,000, so it'd be 900,000 next year. Maybe I've got my powder. Yeah, I've got it right here. She's got it right here. The first year is the biggest increase that we're asking for this, you know, this coming year because we did just lose one to Washington County about three weeks ago, and then last week we lost one to the hot tub company in Johnson City to do inventory because they can make more than inventory to hot tub company and they can work than they can make the AMT. And that's after we've already raised our pay to be so competitive as we can. Um, okay. Yeah, the first the first page of this is what we're paying people yeah. now. The difference from the next year. The next year, the difference. Um, we're at it's three hundred fifty one thousand more. Yeah. So the following year, you'd be asking for nine hundred and fifty five. Yeah, if they put that together. Basically, this year we're asking for seven seventy one. Basically, about seven hundred seventy one thousand. Next year we'd be asking for eight hundred and sixty two thousand and some change. The year after that, it ends up being 950000 And then finally, by the last year, by 2026, if we continue to increase, it'd be a million thirty-eight thousand. Yeah. Over time. If we get raised, <coughs> Medicare raises our rates for transportation for 10 years. I don't care to take that, that part of it. Well, you got it. But in care and Medicare, we've got bills all over the place in Medicare. Like we see. And, you know, to get something nice is like four years out. You know, we've got to do all their studies and everything else. Uh, that I'm kind of just trying to work. You just keep their money and it raised up and all this other. Then I'll come back to you and say, you know, this is what I'm getting this year. This is the standard now. You know what I'm saying? And it that's what but it's got to be there. That's what I'm curious about is, is if we do raise this and it still doesn't help find staff, then what? It helps, you know? It helps a lot, but, well, if you don't, people are going to continue. They're not going to sit here making that kind of money. Well, when do you find out if you've received those salaries or not that? Next year, it could be the year after. We don't know. I mean, we're at the mercy of Tin Care and Medicare. You know, I've been at Tin Care for many, many years because it's federal money that comes down. Then they had a guy out of Georgia running it. You know, why would you have somebody in Georgia running a Tin Care for when we got people here with these jobs and everything else? But they drop us down so much in from our cost, we're not really making much. I mean, we, we probably ain't making money. It costs us to run the money. <laughs> that is where we're at. If you need any help, please feel free to call me anytime. I don't care what time it is. Where are you from, I used to have about 58 employees. Yeah, as far as the staff, the trucks fully, we've got four teams. Um, we need six <coughs> people on each team, and right now we have two openings, two openings, three openings, and three openings. So just to staff the frontline trucks, we're down 10 people. This, this right here is if we had ever cut every part of it done. The actual if everything was full, that's what it cost. And hopefully, if we can come start after, they'll start coming in and fill those places. That's what I'm hoping. But guys, I'm telling you right now, if you ever want to decide if you're for an ambulance, you want it right then before you hang up. 
and if the police and the fire department you want them at your doorstep. It's too late. It takes me 25 or 30 minutes to get some. Or I don't have a trickle bag when we get there. One time in my life, I was very started with this program. We was in Johnson City. We had a cardiac arrest from Bluefield Avenue. The girl was a nurse and she said, if you guys come in here, you're going to save my day. And that's exactly right. I mean, I told her, I'm so sorry. We didn't have the staff. We didn't have, it was all volunteers. We only had four employees, too. You can't go home and try to do Especially with child home. It's a part of that. This stuff they never do. It's like my boy sometimes I tell him, when you leave here, you won't think about it until the next month. I don't think they've ever made ever made ever made time I'm up. I think about how I'm going to do it to make sure that you all get protection from me. They deserve it. That's all I got to say about it. Uh, I appreciate you guys coming. Thank you. Next up is the volunteer fire department. Good evening, but it's a good night. Jones, I'm the chief at West Park County, Clark County Fire Association president. Uh, I'm going to try to make it short and sweet. We currently get funded $442,000 for the seven departments in the county. Um, we're asking for a $35,000 increase, which is $5,000 per department. But it's at $477,000. I will tell you, your packet has a mistake on the first page. On the letter, we figured our increase was $60,000. So where it says it would take us to $65,000, it would really be $66,000. Where it says 470, that would really be 477. But that is uh, keeping that same, that would be 56,000 per department and still keeping that line out of the $15,000 for grant matching and radio activities, training costs that would keep as a separate line. Basically, we're all be going from 442000 to 456000 The total operating budgets, if you combine them for the seven departments, is a little over a million. It's a million and some change. So we're, we're the county's funding almost half of that. The departments are funding the other half. Basically, the county money for each department goes for a truck payment of some type, an engine or tanker or some type of truck payment, the insurance payment. That took all of my was I paid truck payment, insurance payment. That $61,000 was gone. I still owe $7,000 on insurance. It's just an expensive business. Like Terry says, if you can't, if you get behind, it is almost impossible to catch back up. We realize money's not unlimited. We would rather see small increases incrementally than no increase in five years from now, even so far behind, that we have to ask for a huge increase. Y'all have been great to support the volunteer fire departments. We really appreciate it. I feel like we've got seven very good volunteer fire departments in the county. We've got good equipment at all seven. We've got membership at all seven. Some of them struggle more than others. But overall, the, the 
I'm praying that you install me sleep, but you know, I feel like we did it for the kids and for the money that you invest. It's obviously an essential service that people expect. I and the county people think they live in the city, so they don't know the difference when we show up versus if Johnson City or Elizabeth shows up down there. They, they all think they live in the city. <laughs> uh, you know, and they expect to get thank you more than five minutes to get here. I feel like you know, all the departments work really well together. I think we did a good job. So, sorry about the mistake. I discovered it last night. <laughs> I was going through stuff. But, um, we had figured out that everything off of 60,000 instead of 60,000. So, we had to answer the questions. Well, questions, please. The questions. I'm just playing catch up. So your total ask is just the 470 or is it 477? 477. 477. As said to the butler the gentleman before from the fire department, we appreciate your volunteer time and, and efforts to keep us safe being out there. I know you guys know how many Hours you spend over on the bubble on that was about 15 hours. I'm concerned about the mall. It's supposed to be off the mall. See if I can Else, no questions. We appreciate you. All right, and that concludes outside agencies. There we go. You got 15 minutes. <laughs> 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 I feel like we ain't been here long enough. No, <laughs> 15 minutes. I want to thank Ms. Carolyn for working with me on this. She's helped me quite a bit on this budget this year, and I think we've got it uh, narrowed down without any raises, of course, to uh, what uh, we can do when in my budget. So, uh, if you've got any questions, I'll answer them. But uh, other than that, uh, request. <laughs> I think our budget raised up in the neighborhood. Uh, if we cut some stuff too, but uh, actually it went down some million eight seventy seven forty seven. So we went down a little bit. If I ain't mistaken, from that. Got to hire somebody to recycle or something like that. Did I see that? Those new employees. Uh, there is part-time employees. Yeah. Part yeah. 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 So the original, your all's original budget for 21 22 was 1.5. You're looking at 1.85 this year. On the amend, it was two two million two eighty seven forty five. Wrong page. Yeah, that was that's what I was looking at. Because on here it's got the twenty twenty one budget, and we know that there was half a million dollars in there for recycling stuff, and that's on the front page. Yeah, yeah. that's what I was looking at. So that's not which one should I be looking at? That was a capital. 
Third to the last page. It's on the third to the last page. I'm on the very last page on what I was doing. Recycling rates, they go up a lot of stuff. Recycling rates are actually kind of holding through it. They're in the neighborhood of $575, $180 a ton of coal. As of January 21, we have dropped. showing the revenue in here uh, is to show that they will be estimating running in line this year. So that means they are going to cover all of their expenses and the revenue that he's estimating, of course, that will go into the county budget as well. But it shows that his increases, of course, there are no salary increases in here at this time. But it shows that what they're bringing in now, and these are very realistic numbers, that they will cover all of their expenses without having to go to their fund balance at all. And, <coughs> and I think that's the first time that's ever happened, correct? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and if you'll see it underneath the one million eight hundred fifty-six thousand, she's got two hundred fifty-two thousand in surplus, is what they're estimating. So they will actually. Oh, two hundred fifty-two dollars. Two hundred fifty-two thousand. I was thinking. Well, yeah. When I said race, two hundred fifty-two thousand. Well, maybe I'm. Maybe uh, no, 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 just take carry it out. So, so these are conservative <laughs> revenue estimates. We sat down and talked about, and we looked at what the trends were and where they're going at this point. So we feel like these are conservative. They could, they could be higher. So we could But we don't want to had the revenue numbers to offset the expenses, but he did a great job of sitting down and looking at what they And there are increases for things that we know due to the right now that it's just going to be more, and there's not a whole lot we can do about that, including insurance and so forth, which right now the estimate on that's an increase of 15%. Okay, so is your budget staying flat or? Or are you asking for an additional two hundred and fifty thousand? So his his expenses are going up a little bit because we, like I said, we had a lot of inflation items that there's just no way to offset them. So the goal with his, because he does have an income, <coughs> is to try to stay within basically his means, which is what we did. Okay, so. His, so his increase this year for what he's asking for the county is staying flat? Well, he's actually covering all of his expenses with what he's bringing in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you've not seen a whole lot of kickback from the rate increases? Actually, most everybody started coming back. So, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe fuels a little most, driving wheels a little <laughs> It also includes the, the capital outlay payment of 167000 for the equipment loan that they took out, and that'll be payable in January. So if you back that amount, that's really sort of a apples to apples against last year comparison as opposed to the, the 
the budget with that included. Okay, that makes more. Okay, I'm catching on now. Sorry, I'm a little slow to that, I guess. Cardboard stand $175. Yes, sir. <laughs> what about the Eastman program? Eastman, uh, we're getting deeper in with Eastman. Uh, so, uh, that stick's going to start moving out. <coughs> Have you received anything now or uh, so far? We finally just got through the paperwork a month or so ago with all of the uh, paperwork. We had to do it to get paid. So, but all that took care of now, and uh, so payments should start coming in for what we're doing for them and what we're selling. Since all this stuff, you know, when you're getting more money out of you know cardboard and stuff like that, have you guys considered trying to do a recycling program with uh, trash pickups? I know it's a huge. I wish we could. Time. We're not set up. No, we're not set up at all to do a residential pickup. We, just, we don't have to. And if we, be a good idea, you know, if you could do it, but uh, we're, just, we're not set up. I've had a lot of people ask me after we're a mountain. I've had a lot of people ask me in Rome Mountain, have you given any thought to like having a day where you can have a discounted rate on electronics or mattresses? We see them on the road all the time. Electronics is free if they bring them to the landfill. If they take them to the landfill. They're free. Or the recycle center. Well, when they take them to Rome Mountain, it's $20 we got to charge them. we got to transport them. Yeah. But they're free if you bring them to the landfill or the recycle center. Okay. Same way with metal. Metal free if you bring it to the landfill, which should, should be free around the mountain too. They should be charged on the mountain for metal. So it should be free up there too. And recycle it's free. Everybody know, keep Kirk County Beautiful School. Washing machines and the washing machine that loves this stuff is uh, is free. So any of the appliances are free to bring up there. Just uh, the e waste, we just we've got to stack it at recycle because that's where it gets shipped out from. So uh, they want to bring it down there, it's free. Where do you spend all the demolition? Every day we're losing our space. <laughs> uh, as far as uh, taking the folks' property up in there, I, I personally don't believe in intimate domain because I've worked for what I've got all my life and I would somebody come take it. Who in the world, who in the world said eminent domain? They can't even spell it, but I know they said it. Uh, yeah. Trust me, my phone's about melted in two talking to people. Well, it was letters delivered to residents in my district. The commissioner said, uh, advised them that we were going to do an eminent domain to accomplish the population. Yeah, they, it's our availability over there. Well, well, it either is, yeah, you're the printer, you're not. Mr. Goss, I tell you, in order to be able to develop a landfill, you're going to have to have enough land that's going to sustain you for 30 to 50 years. It's not there. Uh, you're probably going to have more money in getting it developed than you're ever going to recoup putting demolition back in there. Would it be adverse for us to find the location away from the landfill area. Is that a big impact to us? Well, it would be an impact to us because we have to babysit the closed landfill for 30 plus years. So we've got all H8 out of there. We've got to do testing there. And then if we close our demo landfill, then the circle starts over. So we've got to do tests in there. You've got to take your leach aid, guys, well, so on. So even on your demo site, you still have to do all the testing required by the EPA? Once you close it, you will. If you just uh, if you snowball it or whatever, just leave it set and dormant for a disaster or something like that, you can get by on state <coughs> without 
having to get into all the testing and the leaching. Yes, the location for a demo site. I mean, away from up where you're at. I think uh, it was viable. I think Austin had talked to somebody that uh, I don't know what he came up with on that, but uh, over around the Cripple Creek, Austin. Yeah. 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 The only thing I'd worry about is going in on Pete's is what's been dumped in there before us. And come back to the hotel and do the job. Come back and bite us. <laughs> My suggestion would be to put a modernized transfer station up there where you can actually do demo and trash. Where would the main is all for the demo? It would be in the same building. No, but I mean, where would they take it? Oh, they'd take it all blunt, or would we take our house off the trash now? We put the same tractor trailer. Yeah, we just probably couldn't accept, you know, heavy weight stuff as far as concrete, stuff like that. But everything else demo. Take. All right, there's nothing more questions or anything. Everybody's good. A comment I don't know if you're here, but Keep Car Can Beautiful. Anytime we ask for your help, we're going to there. Just want to say thanks for that. People call them all the time for cleanups and everything. You're right there with Dr. Whatever we need. Well, I appreciate what they do for the county. If I can help them, same way the fire departments, if they need something, they try to help them. Because they've been to my side numerous times for days fighting fire. So. Right. I appreciate you greatly. And thank you, girls, in the finance office. Well, I forgot your name, but uh, yeah, right. I say it with you several times. So. I really don't know the law, so you don't.